Good afternoon. The time is now 1238 and a quorum of the board is present. State Board of Education regular meeting of 12, 2020 is called to order. Um, we will continue uh, our presentations on educational updates related to COVID-19 with a presentation on state and school budgets. This presentation will be led by Mr. Kyle Garant, Deputy Superintendent of Finance and Operations, and Ms. Joetta Parker, Director of Human Services. There will be a brief PowerPoint presentation. Gentle people, good afternoon. Good afternoon, just uh, sharing my screen with folks. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Eisen. Thank you, board members, again, for this opportunity to, to speak with you on this subject. As we've had to stay at home to address the public health impacts of this pandemic, we have shut down wide swaths of Michigan's economy, which will have significant impact on revenues. The Department of Treasury estimates that there's a one to three billion dollar combined general fund and school aid fund shortfall in the current fiscal year, fiscal year 20. They are also, they are also currently projecting a one to four billion dollar combined shortfall in the general fund and school aid fund for fiscal year 21. The FY20 shortfall is intensified as there's only a little over four months remaining in the current fiscal year to implement reductions. As an example, a $1 billion decline in revenue in the school aid fund alone would translate into a cut of approximately $685 per student. Over the past six weeks, Dr. Rice has been communicating these potential impacts directly to superintendents via regional superintendents meetings, uh, where he shared his thoughts and uh, on the impacts and um, uh, implored districts to begin having conversation with board members and community members about planning for cuts um, at various levels, not knowing what that final number will be at this point. And he also co-authored a joint memo with the executive directors of MASA, MASB, and MSBO that was sent out on April 30th that had similar uh, information around what the expected level of cuts are and the um, steps that districts could take now to plan to prepare for these cuts. This Friday, the Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference will provide the best glimpse yet of the extent the pandemic has had on revenue collection and the state budget. Uh, once those numbers are finalized, those will be the numbers that the legislature and the administration will use to balance the current year budget, uh, the current fiscal year 20 budget, which I will anticipate will begin immediately uh, after the Consensus Revenues, Revenue Estimating Conference this Friday. They will also begin to re-engage on the FY21 development given the new world that we are now in. Of note, uh, Executive Order 2020-26 um, pushed back the date to which state tax collections are due from April 15th to July 15th. So the further away we get, um, as, excuse me, as we look into the fiscal year 21 budget development, there will be another consensus revenue estimating conference in mid-August that will, will likely project better numbers as to what shortfall we are looking uh, at for fiscal year 21, given the delayed of tax collections. With that, I'd like to turn over to my colleague, uh, Joetta Parker, our Director of our Office of Human Resources, to talk a little bit about the impact on state government specifically. Ms. Parker, you may be on mute. I was, thank you. Thank you, thank you Kyle. You. Good afternoon, Dr. Rice and board members. I will share the impact to state government, temp, um, departments and agencies implemented temporary layoffs. Employees were notified on April 22nd. The layoffs lasted for 10 days. The time frame was from April 27th, 2020 to May 8th, 2020. The impact statewide was 29, approximately 2,900 employees, and the impact for MDE was 42 employees. I will now turn it back over to Kyle. 
Thank you, Joetta. And with that, Dr. Rice, uh, we'll turn it back to you and, and answer any questions that board members may have. Thank you, Mr. Garant and Ms. Parker. Uh, board members, any um, any comments or questions for Mr. Garant or Ms. Parker? We have a comment from um, the comment from our board president, uh, President Albridge. Uh, thank you very much. Um, obviously, there's there's not a, a whole lot of information to share yet, although we know that the, the coming information is probably not going to be positive and, and quite dire, unfortunately, for our schools. Uh, my question is for Mr. Grant. Can you talk a little bit, if you if you have the, the knowledge or understanding of this yet, um, was there not a maintenance of effort requirement in, in the CARES Act? And what does that ultimately mean for the next, for the current and the next fiscal year for our schools? Yeah, there there is a maintenance of effort um, in the CARES Act that requires states that accept those dollars to uh, keep a, a certain level of funding um, to schools uh, in order to in order to be eligible to receive those dollars. Um, it's a it's an average of the last three years of funding to schools, but it also allows um, uh, states to request a waiver from the Secretary of Education um, from that requirement um, as well. So there is enough. There's a maintenance of effort requirement, but there's also a waiver should states not be able to um, meet that that requirement. Thank you for that response. Follow up by Dr. Albrich. Um, if, if you know, uh, who is authorized to request that waiver? Would it be the Department of Education? Would it be the legislature? Would it be the governor? Or could it be any of the above? I would have to go back and, and, and check to be sure, um, Cassandra, but I, I would um, anticipate that it's probably the superintendent or the department. But I will I will check and we will follow up with that information. OK, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pugh, a comment. I, I just wanted to take this moment to uh, thank the staff for all that they are doing. I mean, I know that this is a difficult time for everybody um, and especially uh, staff there who are having to make sure that our children are safe, being fed and are being um, all of the above and continuing to be educated and that their social and emotional well-being is, is being tended to. So thank you. And and it's unfortunate that that a, a disease has a pandemic has put us in this place um, at a time when you all are probably working harder than, than ever. So I just thank you. You all yeah. for that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Um, other uh, other questions or comments, Mr. McMillan. Uh, yeah, I guess um, I think it was uh, Kyle or, or Dr. Rice, one of you said that uh, you've kind of indicated or I think I saw the memo to local districts saying that, you know, funds could be cut. I, I would imagine, are you hearing that there are areas for savings? Um, you know, I think that uh, there's always the argument that um, traditional schools make about virtual schools that you know, they should have their funds cut because it's not as expensive and all that. Um, so I'm assuming that there's certainly areas for saving that that everybody, you know, is uh, is working on not only in districts, but also at MDE. Is that is that your understanding? So just a, a few reflections on this. First of all, um, what is challenging, as you are aware, is that we're preparing for an unknown or possibly multiple unknowns. Um, we're preparing for school at a distance. We're also preparing for school face to face. Uh, arguably that requires uh, greater uh, resources, not lesser resources, uh, because you have to you have to prepare for uh, the broadest set of eventualities. Uh, face to face instruction, we know roughly what we need to staff uh, schools. It is true that we don't need uh, precisely the same staff at a distance, but if next year could be a combination of the two, or if it could require additional 
uh, resources associated with additional expenses that don't typically take place in a normal school year, for example, midday bus runs, because you've cut up your, uh, your school into two separate sessions, a morning session and an afternoon session, it could actually require greater transportation costs rather than lesser transportation right. costs. So I would say that the, there is a tremendous amount of challenge associated with not just what the gross costs are, but by extension, what the net costs are and what they are not only with one type of uh, educational system, but with multiple types of educational systems within the same school year. So there are areas for savings. There are areas that may be available for savings if we were able to alight on a single form of public instruction, but the reality is we're not going to be able to make that determination in advance. We're not going to know whether we're going to be face to face or at a distance or a combination thereof month by month, let alone for, out the, for, for the entire year. It's conceivable that we could have very little transportation need in the first month of the school year, but greater transportation need October through June as we do multiple bus runs where we might previously had done fewer. So I'm not suggesting that there couldn't be some savings. There could be, but I'm also suggesting that there could be some greater costs as well, and we're not going to know it until we live it. That's right. Uh, additional questions or, or thoughts? I was just going to add, I think, Dr. Rice, to what, what you said, um, and that is that, that I, this is somewhat comparable to discussions around school closures and when we would always look at the cost and weigh out the cost of a, of a closing of a building, um, it never weighed out to, to the amount, it, the savings was minimal. Uh, and that was always an argument that was a very valid argument. And I think that it will be here too. I think one thing that parents do know uh, at this point now more than ever that they need teachers. Uh, we need support for our children and we're gonna need even greater support. And so that there, there's a cost to the safety, health, well-being and education of our, of our children. Um, and, 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 and hopefully that, that, that remains an important. Mm -hmm. especially for us Th here. Th thank you, Dr. Pugh. Uh, Ms. ramos Montini, I, I, I hear you. Um, do you have a, a comment to share with us? Yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Can you? Okay, good, good. Okay, I, I listened to a webinar by MASSP and MASA, the superintendent, and they were planning and uh, strategizing how to continue uh, distant learning and graduation and what is the year gonna look like next year. And I tell you uh, what the scenarios that I heard are gonna require, I think more money than what we're spending today. Uh, it's gonna be a very complex situation, which it already is, uh, so, yeah, I don't think this is a time to be saving. It's a time to be uh, asking for additional funding, as we are from the federal government uh, this afternoon, uh, in able, uh, so, so we are able to uh, provide all those learning opportunities for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ramos-Montini. Other, um, other questions or comments by state board members? Well, Dr. Rice, I mean, I, I'll, my final comment would be is that I hope that everybody realizes that, you know, money doesn't come on trees and that, you know, the, uh, you know, suggesting maybe that we should increase state taxes is not going to happen. This is not something that families, uh, you know, 25% uh, unemployment, and that doesn't even take into consideration the, uh, the self-employed who aren't able to get unemployment. So, you know, there's, uh, you know, everybody is learning to do with less and, uh, you know, to uh, to try to pile money on the backs of kids uh, debt. I'm sorry, pile debt on the backs of kids in future generations is probably not a good answer either. So, you know, I just I think everybody's trying to learn to do with less. Um, 
you know, some 5% less, some 20%, some 100% less, or, or, you know, significantly more. So, you know, I think that that's, um, you know, it can't just be, uh, we got our hand out and we're not going to, you know, be able to live without a little bit less or maybe even significantly less. We have, I think everybody's going to need to tighten their belt and, and learn, you know, really uh, become more, I don't know, do what they can, but this is not the time to be taxing, increasing taxes on people that can't afford to, can't afford it. Well, well it is certainly a, a challenging moment and we are going to have the opportunity later today to talk about our uh, resolution in support of additional congressional funding. Um, and I'll leave some of this conversation for, for that time. Any other questions or comments for uh, Mr. Garant or Ms. Parker? I guess I just want to begin a, a comment here and um, in response to Tom's comment because we've been having countless discussions around budget and we've talked about exactly what, what you're talking about, Tom. We don't want to uh, put uh, the burden on the backs of, of, of our children uh, and we know that our funding has been lopsided in this state uh, and is the lowest uh, as it relates to growth for our children. We give money to, to corporations and developers uh, and uh, we're, we're siphoning money off from our children. So I agree. Uh, while there are opportunities to save money, it's not our children who should get the, the lesser cost. It's not the educators who we should be concerned about uh, getting all the money. There are areas that we can talk about and that we've been talking about. It didn't just start here. Many inequities uh, have been revealed in this time of COVID. So uh, I just didn't want to let this time go by to not mention that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much to um, to all state board members for their, their comments and their questions. Uh, Mr. Garant, Ms. Parker, thank you for your presentation. Um, Marilyn, are there individuals uh, who wish to address the board during today's meeting? There are, I have 10 individuals and we will start doing that. Um, Mike, can, Mike Flaminio, can you let the first speaker in while I review these um, rules for public comment? Each speaker will be limited to three minutes to address the board and I will keep track of time. We will be strictly following the time limits so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. It is the practice of the board to not respond to comments during the public participation portion of the meeting. We will maintain an atmosphere of respect for all people and disrespecting anyone by name or otherwise will be asked to cease. Uh, is the caller on the line? Yes. I, is this Ray Tellman? David Michelson. Okay. So we're just a little bit out of order here, um, which is totally fine. Um, Mr. Michelson, if you will say where you were from or who you represent and provide your comments, that would be great. Okay. When would you like me to do it? Right now, as soon as you're ready. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, great. Comment, that would be great. Mr. Michelson? Yes. Could you please start speaking? Okay. Um, my name is David Michelson with the Michigan Education Association. And let me just state that I personally applaud all of your efforts in this very difficult situation. I've had the opportunity this semester as an instructor in higher education to make the transition from a regular classroom environment to online learning and assisting my wife, K-12 teacher, producing videos for her school classroom. This is a challenging period in education. But I'm here today uh, because it is my privilege to represent the Michigan Education Association and our approximately 125,000 members across the state. MEA takes pride in our long tradition of supporting teachers, support staff, and higher education employees and providing a quality public education in accordance with Article 8 of the state constitution. 
MEA supports this resolution regarding funding to preserve educational services for all students. We applaud the efforts of Dr. Rice and the State Board of Education in urging support for federal legislation that mitigates the education budget threats caused by this pandemic. Everyone is doing their best to cope with the challenges presented to us in this crisis, and school personnel will face many additional challenges in the coming months. Some of these include training in online services, increased need for counselors, school psychologists, nurses, and health services, supplies for remote working from home, support for delivering materials to students' homes, provisions for special education services, technology for students who don't have access to the internet or devices, availability of masks, gloves, other personal protection equipment, and additional needs for cleaning and food service staff and material. All of this will require adequate financial support from our state and federal government. In supporting this resolution as presented to the members of the State Board of Education, MEA will urge members to contact their lawmakers in support of adequate funding and will advocate within the state education community to the same ends. And I wanna thank you for this opportunity to speak on this critical issue. Thank you, Dr. Michelson. As presented to the members of the State Board of Education. And do we have the next caller, please? Hello, I believe we have the next caller. Could you please state your name and where you're from? And then I will be timing to give you your three minutes and we're happy to hear your comments. As soon as you're ready, please begin. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's Ray Tellman from the uh, Middle Cities Education Association. I am the executive director and uh, thank you, President Ulrich and members of the State Board of Education and State Superintendent Dr. Rice for the opportunity to present today. I sent Mertz a, a video and uh, she promised me that she would forward it along. And uh, it's only a minute and 55 seconds. Um, but in an attempt to get this done within three minutes, I'll ask you to take a look at it uh, later on. It's very impressive for being less than two minutes. What it captures is Idris Jenkins, who's the executor chef at the Michigan, uh, at Muskegon Public Schools. And what that district did to mobilize the, the delivery of uh, breakfast and lunch when the COVID-19 closed their schools. And with almost overnight, without direction or directives, they produced 2,000 meals for delivery, about 80,000 meals in a month. The point is, when you take a look at the video, uh, middle city school districts and, and other districts took up the challenge and provided the activities and absorbed the costs to serve their students and help maintain the fabric of their communities. They did it then, they're doing it now, they're planning for the summer and the fall. And it's not just academics uh, and just virtual and online connectivity, so as important as both of those things are. In addition, they're providing social and emotional support and addressing adverse childhood experiences which, which are associated with this pandemic. So it's, it's with both great distress and despair when we read and we hear, we hear what you heard today about short shortages and we read in, for instance, Bridge Magazine this morning, and you've read it in other media as well. The chair of the Senate K-12 Appropriations Subcommittee said that this is going to be the worst budget in decades for K-12 schools, maybe up to and around $2,000 per pupil foundation cut. Were that to be the case, simply put, K-12 schools will not be able to do what we have been doing and what we need to do going forward, most especially for low-income students. So it is with hope and more than a little appreciation that the State Board of Education is considering a resolution today which preserves educational services for children. Middle City supports your proposed resolution and commits that we will actively work to support your resolve. 
Thank you for your consideration of the proposed resolution and all that you do on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another caller? There's a little bit of a lag time here. You've probably figured that out. And if the caller is on, could you please state your name and where you're from? And if you represent um, anyone in your comments, and then please begin your comments as soon as you're ready. Hello, this is Terry Pettit from SEAC, the Special Education Advisory Committee. Um, we've entered into the time of year when planning ahead must begin for our SEAC membership for the 2020-21 school year. One third of our membership is reaching their three year term limit in June. This movement in membership is going to leave us needing replacements for those leaving. We're required by federal law to maintain a membership consisting of 51% of defined members. Defined members are those members who have a disability themselves or who have a child with a disability for which they currently receive services provided through an individualized education program or an IEP. Most of our openings are organizations and agencies nominating their own replacements, which are then sent to you, the State Board of Education, for approval. However, we do have several openings this fall that I wanted to share with you in the event that you have someone that you would like to speak to regarding their possible interest in completing an application for an open position. We've placed the announcement regarding openings on the SEAC website at www.michigan.gov backslash MDE dash SEAC, S -E -A -C. These openings include two organizational openings, both requiring defined members, and two members at large, one defined and one non-defined member. Something new that we're adding this year is a member at large in reserve. We're going to provide two seats for this in total. This is someone falling into that 51% defined member role who may serve like an alternate. They will be invited to participate in all SEAC meetings and in the event a vote is taken and a member at large is absent, they will have the ability to vote in their place. We're hoping to have all of our membership in place this summer in order for all new members to attend the SEAC retreat in late August or early September, we hope. So I am here today to ask for your assistance. If you know of an organization or of an individual who would be a good fit for the SEAC, please guide them to our website and encourage them to submit an application for the role they're interested in. All of the information they would need to understand a role, to find an application, et cetera, are all detailed on the page. And my in my email information is additionally online. Should anyone have any questions, they can reach out to me directly. So thank you for your time today and for your consideration as we work to create a robust group of members in SEAC with our ultimate goal being to meet the mission by promoting positive outcomes for all Michigan students with disabilities and to advise you, the State Board of Education, as needed. Continued good health to you all. Thanks. Thank you. And do we have another caller? Welcome caller. If you'd please state your name and where you're from and if you're representing any group and then provide your comments as soon as you're able. Okay, um, my name is, uh, can you hear me? I can. Yes. Um, my name is Paul Sandy, and I'm a teacher at Avondale Academy, which is a public alternative school um, <clears throat> in the Avondale School District. And I'm calling in today to this meeting because um, uh, our school was closed last week um, during this pandemic. Um, and our school, which services uh, students who uh, who've either been through trauma or having trouble passing high school, uh, teachers are being replaced with uh, software. And uh, to me, it's very concerning that this school in the district, which is responsible for uh, just 100 plus students, um, but it's the only school in the district that has a majority of students of color. It has the lowest socioeconomic uh, standing of any school in the district. And the students at our school, quite frankly, need teachers the most of anybody. And so I, I'm, I'm calling today out of um, to, to, to get some help, really. Um, many of our students, we're still just trying to get a hold of them. Um, and many of our students themselves have experienced 
trauma during this uh, pandemic break so far. Um, and to me, it's just sad for our kids that when they come back from their school uh, or from this pandemic, that they won't have their school community, their teachers, and their um, and their and just their academics. Um, and but more disturbing is that the district is uh, is still getting the same revenue from each of these students, and many of them live in the city of Pontiac, but that the district is choosing to go with a private uh, corporation called DCI, uh, which there's very little information given to the public. Um, parents and students were not consulted before this, and the teachers, we provided a plan, but the district chose to go against uh, our plan and lay off all teachers uh, coming back. So um, so I guess that's that's my overall comment, is that you know our students just like all students in the Avondale district and in the state of Michigan deserve teachers now more than ever. Uh, this time has shown the value of teachers and why our students, just like all students deserve uh, strong academics. Thank you. Is there another caller? Hello, caller. If you'd please state your name and where you're from and if you're representing an organization and then begin with your comments, we are happy to hear what you have to say. Uh, yes, thank you for taking my call. My name is Aaliyah Moore. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Um, I am a parent uh, at Detroit Public School Community District. I have a graduating class of 2020. I have a 12th grader at Cass Technical High School. And I also have a fourth grader at Paul Robeson Malcolm X Academy. Uh, I'm an active parent. I'm also the PTA president at Paul Robeson Malcolm X. Uh, and I am a product of Detroit Public Schools. Uh, I graduated in 98. By 99, the state had taken over Detroit Public Schools. And you fast forward 20 years later and we're here. And the dismantling and the deterioration of my beautiful district is because of the state of Michigan and the governance that allowed emergency management to take place, but to only take place in Detroit public schools. And so I sat in the courtroom, Circuit District Court of Appeals, me and my fourth grader. And we watch the testimony and the factual evidence come up. And we fast forward to their verdict of two out of three saw the injustice of our children in Detroit public schools not having the basic minimum education. And for Miss Nikki Snyder, the nurse, the advocate for the disabled, and for Mr. Tom McMillan, the mayor, former mayor. These people went to college. They went to U of M in Eastern Michigan. But the question is, what would have happened if their parents were told that they didn't have a right, a basic right to education? They would not have become what they have become, and they would not have been sitting on the Board of Education since 2017. I'm an advocate for children, not just children with money. Because that seems to be, if she's an advocate, of, of, of you have to have some type of financial, to, to, you know, advocacy is universal. And that's very contradictory for you to be an advocate, but yet you're questioning the circuit district's uh, court of uh, their decision. And so I, I thank the board for your leadership thus far, and I, I have read the resolution. I thank my board. Uh, Dr. Vitti and the board for sending their letter, but it was kind of neutral because I feel like, you know, the debt was created by the state, so it should be canceled. You know, financial, you can't put a, a, a number, a financial number on the heartache and the, and the missed opportunities that our babies have been under emergency management, so cancel the debt. And as a stakeholder, I stand with that. Cancel the debt. 
the, the, the state has the right right now. Gretchen Whitmore has the right. Cancel the debt. And we'll be even. And our babies will have some type of even playing ground in this thing called education. Thank you very much. Do we have another caller? Hello? Hello. If you'd please state your name and where you're from and if you're representing a group and then provide your comments, I will start the timer and you'll have three minutes. Thanks for calling in. Thank you very much. And it seems like there's a time lag on the stream. So this is Tom Padroni. Um, I am an associate professor of curriculum studies and policy sociology and a teacher educator at Wayne State University. And thank you so much, board, for taking up the issue today, which I will speak on, which is the proposal that you'll be considering later on this afternoon on what people are calling the Detroit literacy case or uh, Whitner versus Gary B. Um, the comments that I would like to make are in line with the ones that I was listening to <laughs> when I was put on the call from Aliyah Moore. And I'd like to back up some of the things that she has said. Um, and I know that this board has heard before. Um, the Detroit uh, schools were under emergency management by the state or some form of state control for 20 years, roughly, beginning in 1999. And um, I've done the research and looked back and saw that at the time of the first uh, state uh, takeover in 1999, immediately before that, there was uh, documented in the 1998 CAFR reports or comprehensive annual financial reports, a $93 million operating surplus for the district, not a deficit, and that um, uh, enrollment was gradually increasing at the rate of about 1,000 uh, students per year, so in a very manageable way, and test scores were rising relative to the state averages. Um, I heard a beep, but I'm going to assume I'm still on. Um, uh, all of those things uh, turn negative and have gone negative for most of the period of emergency management and state control that ended, I believe, on January 1st, 2017. Um, I think the governor's logic before, or the defendant's logic before in declaring the case moot was based on the assumption that uh, the damages had been made up for, uh, the budget had been restructured uh, through the legislature, the district had sort of been restarted, and it was a new era of uh, control by the board. Well, the most uh, immediate critique that we need to pose to that is uh, there was an audit that showed there were $500 million worth of capital expenses needed for the district that had uh, simply not been addressed. They're the result of negligence during the era of state control. Um, but one could go on about the uh, squandered lives and squandered opportunities and all the damage that was caused during the state era that we're just beginning to recover from now, but won't recover from uh, if, if what the governor ha and the defendants have said before is the final word. Um, the resolution you're considering, which I, I hope you'll pass, I congratulate you if you do, um, I think will help a lot um, in conveying to the governor as well as one of the most important defendants in the case, how important it is to settle in the interests of Michigan children. I applaud her work on the COVID case. I know she's very busy, but all she needs to do is make a very simple statement uh, in the press uh, that she intends to settle. And that will send the signals that the Sixth Circuit Court needs to hear that the plaintiff and the defendants are comfortable and there's no need for further review. I'm assuming I'm still on and um, thank you for your time. Thank you for making you're still on. And do we have another caller? Hello. Hi. Hi. If you would please state your name and where you're from and if you're representing a group and then uh, begin to start your comments and I will be timing you. You'll have three minutes. Thank you for calling. Hi. Uh, thank you very much, State Board of Education members and State Superintendent of Instruction, Dr. Michael Rice, for all of your leadership and support of public education in Michigan. I appreciate having the opportunity to provide a few comments during the public participation section of this board meeting. My name is Chris Wygent, and I'm the Executive Director of the Michigan Association 
of Superintendents and Administrators, commonly known as MASA. My brief comments this afternoon uh, will focus on the recommended resolution that is on your agenda for later regarding funding to preserve educational services for children. Recently, MDE, MASA, the School Board Association, and the Business Director Association developed a collaborative memo that went out to all superintendents, central office administrators, business directors, and school board members in the state of Michigan, with the purpose being to ensure that those parties that I just mentioned were well aware of the fiscal challenges that are forthcoming for all school districts in the state. Kyle Grant mentioned this earlier in his comments. The message behind the memo is clear and strong and included these two statements. Short of an enormous additional federal appropriation from Congress, school districts will likely have to make deep cuts to their budgets for the next fiscal year. It also included this statement. The administration has said that our revenues combined in the general fund, school aid fund, could be below budgeted estimates by up to $3 billion for this fiscal year and up to $4 billion for next fiscal year. For illustration purposes only, all else being equal, a $1, a $1 billion decline in revenue in the school aid fund translates to a cut of approximately $685 per pupil. And as Ray Talman mentioned earlier, to make matters even more concerning, last night, Representative Wayne Schmidt said that districts should be preparing for the worst, and the numbers that were communicated were the possibility of $2,000 per pupil cut. I don't need to tell you how devastating this level of per pupil cut would be to absolutely every district in the state. Later in your meeting, you will be considering a resolution that formally requests that the Michigan State Legislature and the Michigan Congressional Delegation support a bill to preserve educational services to Michigan school children that have been threatened as a result of this pandemic. As the Executive Director of MASA, I am requesting on behalf of all of the school district superintendents and central office administrators that the State Board of Education consider the approval of this resolution, which will help to move the needle by requesting additional funds for school districts that have been working so hard with students, parents, and many others to try to effectively provide instructional and other services during this time that the school facilities have been shut down. Keeping in mind the financial challenges that we are all going to be facing very shortly, any additional COVID-19 funding that can be secured would help mitigate the significant fiscal impact that lies ahead as we learn how to deal again with less. Thank you again for your consideration of this resolution and the important message that it sends to policymakers at the state and national level, as well as all the school districts across the state of Michigan. Thank you again. Thank you. And do we have another caller? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, if you'd please state your name and where you're from and if you're representing a group and then um, begin your comments, that would be great. I will be timing you for three minutes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, my name is Dr. Caitlin Papillars. I am a recent um, graduate from the College of Education at Wayne State University and I will be an assistant professor in the College of Education at University of Texas, San Antonio in the fall. And I'm calling today for two specific reasons. Um, the first one, my um, dear friend and colleague, Paul Sandy, was on just a little bit earlier talking about the closure of the high school in which he worked at Avondale Academy. And I would just like to raise that closure to the Board of Education. So they are aware that uh, pretty extreme measures are being taken right now um, to push for education technology, push for online virtual academies, and to also continue the closure of public schools that are attended by predominantly black and brown students in the state of Michigan. Um, the second reason I am calling today is to voice my support of the State Board of Education in their um, support of the literacy lawsuit and their support of Detroit students, parents, teachers, and community members who are fighting for equitable and just public education in Detroit and throughout the state of Michigan. 
I've been really impressed by Governor Whitmer's movement around the COVID crisis, but I have been ashamed by her inaction regarding the literacy lawsuit. I am urging her to join Detroit community members, students, and teachers to settle the lawsuit, especially since she campaigned on this issue. Um, it is her responsibility to ensure that all children in the state of Michigan have access to equitable public education, and her movement on the literacy lawsuit is urgently needed. Um, thank you again for the time, and thank you so much to the Board of Education for your continued work for Detroit students and for Michigan students. Thank you for your comments. All right, thank you, bye. Okay, I believe we have another caller on the line. If you could please state your name, where you're from, if you're representing a group, and then begin providing your comments. I will um, be running a three minute timer. So thanks for calling in. Hi, my name is Lisa Massett. I'm calling from West Bloomfield, Michigan. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to address the state's top 10 in 10 years set of strategies that came out in 1996, um, specifically addressing a few of the values and guiding principles outlined in the very beginning of the plan. Um, to quote just a few phrases, uh, quote, develop a coherent and cohesive strategy, implement that plan with continuity for multiple years, student-directed learning, and um, final quote, the work on instruction must take priority. I'd like to see instruction take priority in Michigan. Um, these basic yet key points are the introduction to a 40 plus page document that is intended to provide Michigan families with a comprehensive overview. Yet if we only read this initial mission as I've summarized, it lends to a few questions with regards to our current situation with education in the state of Michigan. Um, first, what is the MDE doing to secure an academic experience that provides rigor to all students, regardless of where students are at, including those that are not currently or aren't anticipated to be behind. What is the MDE's plan going forward and how to support our district superintendents with learning? The changes we've experienced demand action. With continued learning occurring online, what is the plan going forward? Should districts need to use it into the next school year? How is our educational infrastructure with regards to technology changing and adapting to what's going on in our world? I think it's fair to say that this experience should provide us with a template going forward. So should we need it again, we have some structure in place. Our students deserve an ongoing rich learning experience, regardless of how and where, where they are learning, whether it's in school or at home, regardless of what demographic they are within the entire state. Additional attention is required for all students, including those that are in areas that are not demonstrating a need for food or special education services. All Michigan students deserve to be challenged with regards to the education that they receive. Instruction and student success need to be a priority now more than ever. I thank you for your time. Thank you. And I believe we have another caller. If the caller is hi, is the caller on the line? If you'd please state your name, where you're from. Hey, if, you're, if you're representing a group and then begin your comments, I will have um, a three minute timer that I will be running. So thanks for calling in. Thank you so much for you all having me. Thank you so much to the state board for listening. I am Jamari A. Hall from Detroit, Michigan, and I am a plaintiff on the right to literacy lawsuit of Detroit. And I am calling on the behalf of all Detroit Public School students. And once again, I would like to thank everyone and hope everyone is at home and safe. And it's just a, a real pandemic that our schools, Detroit Public Schools, have been going through from the facilities to the resources onto the funding. And we still have so much potential and we want better. We want more. Like a lot of times we're asking for this minimum requirement of education, but what really is a minimum requirement of education? 
really all we can do is have the resources. If we do not, if we lack the resources and we lack the proper safe facility to learn in, how can we be productive students? How can we go on into the world to be productive citizens? How can we know how to vote? How can we go on into the world and get a career? As stated before, since the state has took over Detroit Public Schools in 1998, there has been no repairs. There has been so many curriculum classes cut, so many extracurriculum classes cut. There have been teachers' pay cut, but we continuously have state standardized standardized tests to see where we are and how proficient we are in our grade level on subjects that we aren't capable of learning because we lack the resources. And it's really sad for us to be fighting and crying out for a call of help and for help. In 2020, we are really fighting for the right to an education for students. School is a requirement. It is a fundamental foundation of who we are today. And a lot of times we look at the parents and say it's the parents' fault because the parents didn't lay the foundation of education. The parents' duty is to send their child to school prepared to learn. I will be seven classes. Now I'm a college student and I'm struggling. It shows that I've missed out on education. I've missed out on the opportunity to be the best me, to be a productive student. And it's sad that I had the parents, my parents helping me with education and my parents pushing me. There are some students who do not have that, and school is supposed to provide that for us. We're going to school every day just as the teachers prepare to learn. It is not just us students going through it, it's the teachers also. They don't have the resources to teach. They're also in the facilities with broken heaters and no central air, with rodents running around, with unusable bathrooms, with textbooks from 1998, 10 textbooks for a class of 40 students. And then we still have so many counselors that come into the schools, thousands and thousands of dollars that we spend on standardized tests, thousands and thousands of dollars that we push, that we spend to push programs, when all we need to do is go back to the fundamentals. We lack the sir, I'm sorry. sir, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You may not have been able to hear the um, timer go off. I'm so sorry, but thank you so no, much. No, uh, no problem. We appreciate you calling in. Yes, ma'am. Have a great day. You too. I believe this concludes public comment. Mike Flaminio, can you please verify that? <clears throat> yes, that's all the participants. Okay, public comment is concluded. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marilyn. Thank you, Mike. Uh, our next topic is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, uh, or CARES Act. This presentation uh, will be done by Mr. Kyle Garant, Deputy Superintendent of Finance and Operations. There will be a brief PowerPoint presentation, I believe. Uh, Mr. Garant, welcome back. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Just sharing my screen now with everybody. As you remember, we spoke about this uh, issue or this this topic uh, at the uh, uh, April board meeting. Um, this first slide is kind of a, a refresher of some information that we shared at the time, which is all that we knew at the time of that board meeting um, was you know the overall national amount Michigan uh, was slated to receive just shy of uh, $390 million. Um, the, the U.S. Department of Education said they would approve applications from states within three days. We were, they turned ours around in 48 hours, so it was a, a, a great experience for us to get that uh, application approved as quickly as we, as we did. Um, uh, states must allocate at least 90% of that state grant to uh, eligible school districts, 
And uh, it's important to note that uh, these dollars um, from the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund, which is part of the CARES Act, are one time appropriation, the one time dollars uh, that will not be ongoing funding uh, for states and school districts uh, into the future. A piece of information that was not available um, at the April board meeting was the allowable use of funds. Since then, the US Department of Education has sent guidance to states to clarify what those uh, uh, areas are and outlines 12 broad categories um, that range from uh, any activities authorized under existing federal education laws like ESSA or IDEA, um, implementing learning at a distance, which includes closing the digital divide with device and connectivity purchases, developing online instruction, as well as the provision of providing meals and mental health services and supports, um, as well as COVID-19 preparedness and response activities. Uh, to find the full list of the 12 broad categories, you can click on the uh, hot link there in the third bullet. Uh, district applications were uh, the district applications for districts, excuse me, were open uh, this past Friday. We uh, worked uh, very hard. I need to give a shout out to our grants team uh, led by Louis Burgess and Kevin Walters who were able to turn around an online application uh, in, in our MEGS Plus system that districts use to apply for um, the majority of their federal funding. Um, it was open on Friday and it was as burden free as possible uh, while uh, allowing us to fulfill our responsibilities as fiduciaries for these dollars. As of this morning, we have uh, 378 districts that have gone in and started an application with 14 districts who have already submitted their application. Uh, it's important to note, and I've seen this um, in print and in other conversations, that while the, the uh, district allocations for these dollars are based upon the percentage of Title I Part A that an eligible district receives that this these are not Title One dollars specifically. The dollars can be used in those twelve broad categories uh, that I mentioned in the previous slide. The CARES Act also provides um, states the opportunity to reserve up to ten percent of the state fund to uh, award to support allowable activities. MD will use the allowable reserve fund to establish an educational equity fund. These dollars will be allocated to eligible school districts with the primary purpose of reducing the digital divide. We will allow applicants uh, the ability to submit applications that align with the broad 12 categories that I mentioned earlier, but our, our primary focus will be on supporting schools, reducing the digital, the digital divide uh, in their school communities. Additional information, including application guidelines and eligibility, uh, will be available in the coming weeks. Uh, right now, our focus and priority has been on um, um, getting the formula application out and supporting districts in planning and applying for those dollars, as that is the larger pot. Um, and we will, again, uh, have more information and more conversation about the reserve fund um, in the coming weeks. And with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Dr. Rice and uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Garant. Uh, board members, comments or um, questions for our Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations? Going once and twice. This is an important pool of money. Um, as our Deputy Superintendent, Mr. Garant notes, it's also a pool of money that in total is $390 million. And when you reflect upon it relative to uh, the numbers that preliminarily were shared by the administration several uh, weeks ago about what the size of the deficit could be in the general fund and the state school aid fund, you realize that those deficits uh, exceed by several orders of magnitude this $390 million, hence the need for additional federal aid. Uh, I see um, in the chat uh, a comment by uh, Dr. Albrich and then a uh, question by Dr. Pugh. Thank you. I, I just wanted to commend the department on the creation of the equity fund. You know, uh, we often talk about um, inequities in schools, but very rarely do we have the opportunity to actually do something about it. 
in a manner such as this. And so I think it was um, it was it it came with great foresight from the department to be able to do this and to set up an application process so quickly and uh, allow schools to um, demonstrate a need for why uh, this is so important important to them. So I just wanted to commend you for doing that and thank you on behalf of the school districts that will have an opportunity to compete for these funds. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Albridge. Uh, Dr. Pugh? And I, just, and, and I too uh, wanted to follow up with uh, what Dr. Albridge uh, mentioned is that a lot of times we talk about uh, inequities and uh, but to be given this opportunity and you all to be able to quickly see that it was an opportunity to address these inequities, and we know that these inequities are all over the state. Uh, there's not one particular area uh, who is hit by, who's not hit by uh, a deficit around the digital divide. Uh, my question is around the additional funding that came to the state of Michigan through this act, through these uh, dollars, and if we know how those that funding will be used. So I know that all the funding did not come straight through MDE. Um, if we know how the additional funding will be used. Uh, yeah, so there, I mean, there are um, dollars that are um, allocated, for instance, to uh, the governors of each state to um, to provide support uh, in the education well, both in K-12 and higher ed. Some of those conversations are still ongoing. Uh, we have um, a breakdown of all the funding across not just education, but transportation and other uh, sectors um, that would give you a total uh, of all the dollars that the state are receiving across those sectors um, that I can I can share with you. To your, to your question, some of those, um, some of the conversations and some of the um, areas where those dollars will be spent are still being formulated um, ac across uh, state agencies, but we can share what we have at this time with you if that would be helpful. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Other, other questions or comments by state board members? Question or comments by other state board members? Hearing and seeing none. Uh, Mr. Garan, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. So, board members, at this time, may I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of April 14th, 2020? So moved. Support. Uh, I heard a, a so moved and a support. Um, is there any discussion? Marilyn, if you could take the roll call vote, please. Yes. Becto? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Hugh? Yes. Ramos Montini? Ramos Montini? Are you muted? I know all about that because I did it earlier accidentally. Ramos Montini, I can't hear your vote. Okay, Marilyn, why don't we Montini? move on? Okay. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? Yes. And Albrecht? Yes. And go back one more time to Ramos Montini. OK, motion passes. OK, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, it's time for the report of our president. Uh, thank you. I will be very, very brief today. I know we have a couple items coming up on the agenda that could um, take uh, quite a bit of time. So I just wanted to mention um, once again, this is our second meeting that virtually. So thank you. Thank you to everyone who has pulled this together and uh, made this work for us. Um, also to uh, mention that we have many, many, many seniors in the state of Michigan who are preparing to graduate in the next few weeks. Uh, we congratulate them, uh, particularly as they have shown, I think, a resilience that most of us probably at their age would not have been able to demonstrate. And they've, uh, you know, our students have really handled this so well. So um, special congratulations 
congratulations to the seniors that are graduating in the next few weeks. Um, and they're going to be doing it in, in new and different ways, but um, they're on to wonderful things moving ahead. Uh, special thanks to the teachers, of course, who have been working so hard to make sure that learning continues, even though uh, it's in a new environment um, and, and many new ways. Uh, and and to the parents that are um, do working so hard to make sure that that uh, this is a seamless time for their kids right now. Um, I think that we're all bracing for a lot of unknowns that are coming up. We're hearing some very difficult things that are uh, happening with the state budget. Um, and we're going to be talking about ways to potentially alleviate that uh, later on in our, our discussions today. But um, I, I think we really need to um, have a full understanding of what's ha happening with the budget and do the best that we can to make sure that um, our schools are as protected as possible because none of this was their fault and it definitely wasn't the kids fault and um, uh, you know there's been talk of 20 25 percent cuts to the budgets uh, that would be absolutely devastating to our schools so um, I, I hope this board can come together and um, advocate on behalf of the schools in the state of Michigan at both the state and the federal level uh, and that uh, that is it for me thank you Thank you, President Albrecht. Uh, comments uh, by the state superintendent will be likewise brief. I want to say that in the midst of a pandemic, it is good to remember that we still have much of which to be thankful. I'm thankful every day for our state's teachers, support staff, and administrators who have stood tall and have continued to work hard for children in the midst of a pandemic. I'm thankful every day for MDE staff who are supporting our local educators, schools, and districts during the pandemic. I'm thankful for the caring of state board members about thinking through what is necessary for our young people, for our educators, for our schools at this fraught moment. Thankful for the leadership of the governor during the pandemic. Thankful for the partnership with the governor's office and particularly for the work of Brandy Johnson the governor's representative on the state board. I'm thankful for the partnerships with other state departments, a number of which have been mentioned today, but we are partnering broadly across state government as a rule and more substantially in the midst of a pandemic with the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development on the feeding of children and families, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, on social and emotional supports, with the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs on child care, with LEO, with MDCR, the Department of Civil Rights, the Office of the State Employer, with the Office of Civil Service. Uh, it really is a team effort. We so appreciate the support of the State Budget Office, uh, DTMB, and many others to help us continue to do what we've done, notwithstanding and through the midst of a pandemic. And with that, I'd like to pivot to the report of our Michigan Teacher of the Year. Ms. Kara Lougheed is the 2019-2020 Michigan Teacher of the Year. She will present her report. Ms. Lougheed is an English language arts and history teacher at Stony Creek High School in Rochester Community Schools. And we appreciate her involvement in the state board this year and her leadership. Ms. Lougheed. Hi, everybody. Um, it's good to hear all of your voices and, and see your faces. Um, so I just want to warn you, I live out in Romeo, and so my Wi-Fi is not great. So if I freeze or disappear, I apologize in advance. I wanted to just fill you in on some of the uh, of what I've been working on from home because other than a couple of trips to the store, I have been at my home. Um, but I've been working on a, lumber, a summer learning loss document with um, Sheila Alice and a whole bunch of other partners and consultants with MDE. We're working on that. I think it's going to be finished probably by the end of this week. I specifically have been working on the high school section, focusing on um, English language arts and mathematics. And these are my partners on the screen. Just wanted to give them a little bit of a shout out because it's been really, um, really rewarding working with them on that project. 
Um, a couple of things that I have done is I did a student town hall with Senator McMurrow on April 27th um, and the Lieutenant Governor joined us and my own superintendent, the superintendent of the year, Dr. Shaner. And then we had seven high school students from around the um, uh, from around her district, from around Senator McMurrow's district. And then, let's see if I can get this to work. And then I did a parent town hall on May 5th with Senator Paul Hankey and the MEA president and Michelle Pizzo joined me for that and a couple of other uh, teachers and a child psychologist. And we answered parent questions that were submitted mostly through Facebook. And that was um, a really good event. I, I felt really positive about that and that we basically were focusing on helping parents not feel so stressed about um, remote learning. Um, as far as my national events, everything's pretty much been canceled. Um, I didn't get to go to Washington. Um, that might be postponed, I don't really know. Uh, we are doing check-ins and we've been getting some great PD and we've been updated, getting some updates. We did make a video, it's on YouTube, it's called Dear Teachers, We've Got This. So if you wanna check it out, um, all the state teachers of the year did that together. Um, we did a chat all together, Ask a Teacher of the Year, that was really fun. But overall, there's just a lot of unknowns. Um, I don't know when the National Teacher of the Year is going to be announced. I think it's going to be soon, though. Um, so keep an eye out for that, and I'll I'll post and tweet about it. Um, and then this was kind of the state teachers inspired the Google Doodle. So I wanted you to see that. Um, and then, of course, mine that I did when we were out at Google in San Francisco is, you know, the superhero theme. It's not really surprising considering my love of superheroes. Um, so I thought that was pretty neat. Um, and then just some of the other things I've been working on, obviously, still working with the Governor's Educator Advisory. Um, I presented to some new teachers with MEA. Um, I wrote a blog to first year teachers because I started thinking how hard this year would be for a first year teacher. I did a couple of interviews and then obviously I'm checking in with my regional teacher. Ms. Lahid, you have frozen on us. Ms. Lahid, can you hear us now? Okay, see, I told you that was gonna happen. There you go. <laughs> but, I'm back. I knew that was gonna happen, but I was pretty much done anyway. I was just gonna, um, let me see if I can get this back. Um, yes, let's see. Here we go. Can you all see it? My screen. Okay, um, and so then just lastly, I want to just uh, say happy teacher appreciation to everybody. Um, my friend, the Wisconsin Teacher of the Year, wrote this eight ways to th say thanks, and I thought it was really appropriate. Um, a lot of things that you have all talked about. Um, and then I liked this quote that teachers have three loves, love of learning, love of learners, and the love of bringing the first two loves together. And I think that pretty much encapsulates We've all been doing the past few months trying to figure all this out. That is it for me. Let me stop sharing. And hold on. There we go. Okay. Okay, all done. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Lawheed. Any any reflections for Ms. Lawheed? Um, hearing and Seeing none, thank you very much, Ms. Lougheed. Uh, we appreciate you. you and we appreciate your leadership. The next item on today's agenda is approval of an amendment to the agreement between the State Board of Education and the Superintendent of Public Instruction. Um, essentially, uh, given the state's challenging financial uh, picture, uh, a number of the top um, officials in the state department heads have indicated that they are prepared to take a 5% cut through the end of the uh, fiscal year. Um, our uh, work with um, between the state board and the state superintendent is a little bit different because there's a formal contract. I can't simply cut my own uh, pay. That needs to be done uh, bilaterally, that is to say with an agreement uh, with the state board. So Dr. Albrich, if you would, please. 
Uh, thank you. I think you laid that out well. Many of the state leaders are taking a voluntary reduction in salary um, during these unprecedented times, and uh, Superintendent Rice has generously agreed to do the same. However, uh, in discussions with the Attorney General's office, we confirmed that this would actually require the state board to attach an addendum to his contract prior to this happening. So I would like to make a motion that the State Board of Education authorize myself, the president, to enter into an amendment to the employment contract with uh, Dr. Michael Rice to reduce Superintendent Rice's salary by 5% for the remainder of the current fiscal year. Support. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Um, is there any discussion? Um, this is Michelle. Um, I just wanted to make a note that um, that the superintendent uh, already has, I, although I understand the need for the cut and the leadership for it, but that the superintendent took a, took a significant cut in his pay to come and become the state superintendent. So I um, appreciate your sacrifices, um, which is more than just this cut here. Thank you. Other, uh, other questions or comments? or discussion before we vote? Well, I'll just jump in. Um, and, and I just, I just uh, reiterating what has been said. This does not mean uh, that you, it's not like you all aren't working uh, lighter or you are white working lighter, you guys are working harder. This is the time when you all are having to think uh, innovatively, think in a way that you've never had to think. Uh, you're having to make calls and, and be on, on call at, at all times of the night and morning. And so uh, this is not at all uh, indicative of the workload that you have you have assumed. Uh, we just appreciate you for doing this. Thank you. Anything else before we vote? I, I would just like to second that. I can tell you that uh, <sighs> In the last several weeks, uh, the last couple of months actually, I think that um, Dr. Rice and I have had more conversations at seven, eight, nine o'clock at night than we've ever had before. Uh, so please know that um, these individuals at, in the superintendent's office are working very, very hard and they're working very long hours. And uh, work from home, which we're doing right now, does not mean work for less. And uh, we appreciate um, Superintendent Rice's um, offer in this, but in no way does it mean that there is a 5% reduction in um, duties. Thank you. Thank you. Other, uh, other reflections before we vote? Um, hearing none, um, Marilyn, if you could take a roll call vote, please. Becto? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. You? Yes. Ramos Montini? I will come back to you on the last vote. Ramos Montini texted me. She was a yes, by the way. Nikki? Yes. Thank you. Tiffany? Yes. Tiffany. And Sandra Albridge? Yes. And I'm coming back to. Lupe Ramos Montini. Okay, I do not hear a vote there. Can you hear me? Oh, no. hi. Hi, what's your vote, Ramos Montini? <laughs> yes. I was Thank trying you. to get back here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item on today's agenda is discussion or action on resolution regarding funding to preserve educational services for children. Uh, may I please have a motion to approve the resolution regarding funding to preserve educational services for children? I have a, uh, I have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? Oh, um, I have a uh, discussion point. I'm sorry. Yes, I've got I've got uh, in the, the chat. Uh, well, uh, at the appropriate time, Representative I, McMillan. Uh, yeah, at the appropriate member time. McMillan. Yeah, at the appropriate time. But if there's discussion on the general motion, that's fine. OK, any discussion on the general motion before 
Um, uh, Mr. McMillan has uh, four um, amendments that he'd like to move, but anything on the general? Uh, President Albridge. Thank you. Uh, I just want to. I, I just want to kind of give a little bit of context to this. We heard comment earlier today indicating that the current revenue estimates indicate that there could be a billion dollar shortfall in the school aid fund amounting to a potential cut of about $685 per student. But I don't think that tells the full story. Yesterday, there was a Bridge Magazine article in which Wayne Schmidt um, said that he, he has instructed school officials that um, to prepare for the worst, uh, the worst budget in decades, in fact, uh, which could be a potential cut in the per pupil foundation grant allowance of up to 25%, uh, which um, amounts to, I believe, roughly $2,000. And so the State Board of Education has a constitutional responsibility. Uh, in the constitution, it says, quote, advise the legislature as to the financial requirements for public education. And um, so that is why we are uh, bringing forth a resolution today encouraging uh, folks to work with both the state and the federal governments to ensure uh, a fair um, budget process for our schools. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Albridge. Uh, Ms. Snyder. I think she was just seconding mine. I yeah, think I was, but I do. I would add that. Um, I would just add that we do have. I mean, what's currently happening with the with the three hundred ninety million dollars that has come through the CARES Act um, waivers that give us flexibility to do things in other areas. Um, Kyle just said he'd be willing to forward that breakdown of those dollars so that we understand them more as they're coming in. Right now, we currently have more. So, you know, when we read articles like that, that just sort of perpetuate fear without it being fact at this point in time, and we have more, I just don't err on the side of we need more. So that's that's going to be kind of the foundation of where I'm at. I don't think that's a responsible thing to do as an elected official that um, while we're literally getting extra and more to say we need more. We need to define that need first. And without the breakdown of those dollars that we haven't gotten yet, it's just sort of like a general statement that we're making. And to families right now, they're just trying to put food on the tables and get to work. Uh, I'm just not gonna send that message to them. So I second uh, Tom's um, resolution, but I, there's more I'm sure to come yet. Thank you very much, Ms. Snyder. Ms. Fecto? Um, well, I think we do know that the revenues are going to be drastically less, state revenues, which is the bulk of the money that funds our schools. Um, I know our sales tax is so way down, our income tax is way down. Um, there's, uh, uh, so I don't think it's, it's unknown that we're going to have dire consequences that is not going to be met by the CARES money. I think it's just a matter of how much we're going to be down that we don't know. So um, I'd rather, um, we need the money now uh, for the future, especially when we take into consideration the special ed needs and the, uh, the money there um, as well. That's a, a big hole that's going to be there. Um, I think um, if we can bail out cruise ships and give huge tax cuts to the wealthy in this country, I think that giving money to kids who are our future to have the ability to have decent jobs and, and a future, um, it's needed now. It's needed now. When we talk, talk about the burden in the future, well, the burden is now, and they're gonna pay for it with incredibly huge class sizes, less educational opportunity, if we don't come through with some um, some ways to mitigate the loss that is evident, evident right now. Thank you very much, Ms. Fecto. Uh, Mr. McMillan. Yeah, just before uh, we get to the uh, the uh, my amendments, you know, I just uh, wanted to say that I, you know, when I was a legislator, I fought that corporate welfare more than anybody, probably. Grant, uh, Governor Granholm was handing it out to Hollywood uh, billionaires and millionaires, and I fought it. I fought that and and all corporate welfare. So. 
Um, you know, I hope, uh, I kind of doubt, but I hope that Gov Governor Whitmer will, you know, cut all corporate welfare. I kind of doubt it um, because that's typically how they uh, govern is by press release. We've created so many jobs by giving money out and all that. So that's, um, that probably won't happen. It should. And I hope, and I'm glad that the, my fellow uh, colleagues on the board thinks that she should do that as well. Um, I also note that, um, you know, my resol my uh, amendments are just going to be for, you know, wanting my desire that tax dollars are spent prudently. And, uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, that we're not laying trillions of dollars of debt on the backs of uh, of the children that are going through schools right now, which we continue to do anyway. Um, I understand that the executive order made it more difficult. She could have made it so that school districts and other uh, uh, education uh, and public education entities could reduce their expenses. But as I understand it, her EOs have indicated that that districts are not allowed to, to reduce payroll. I, I could be wrong, but that's if that's the case, that's problematic. It, she exacerbated the, the problem potentially. Uh, certainly across the state, uh, you know, tons of people are being laid off and, and having to deal with uh, reduced uh, pay. So it would have, uh, I hope that that's not the case, but I'm understanding that it is. And I, I just hope that, uh, but again, I, I don't I'm I'm simply going to uh, have amendments that say if we want federal funding, uh, we should make sure that the money that's being spent now is being spent well as best as possible and um, that they do everything they can to not make this more debt, but just uh, reduce other areas um, so that there's not more debt created. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. McMillan. If we don't have any other comments uh, before hearing the amendments, perhaps if someone, uh, our board president or our board executive could read the base resolution so that our uh, listening audience knows what we are, um, uh, what we're debating at the current time. And uh, then we can uh, reflect on Mr. McMillan's uh, amendment. So, uh, President Albrich, would you do the honors? Absolutely. So, the resolution before the State Board of Ed Education is titled Resolution Regarding Funding to Preserve Educational Services for Children. Whereas the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in 4,081,970 confirmed cases and 280, I'm sorry, 281 1,399 deaths worldwide as of Sunday, May 10th, whereas the pandemic, pandemic has resulted in 1,323,028 confirmed cases and 79,124 deaths nationwide as of Sunday, May 10th, whereas the mm. pandemic has resulted in 47,138 confirmed cases and 4,051 deaths in Michigan as of Sunday, May 10th, Whereas Michigan positive COVID-19 cases were on March 10th, 2020. Whereas in response, the governor announced school closures two days later on March 12th in a stay home, stay safe order on March 23rd, among many, many other efforts to address this public health emergency. Whereas the public health emergency has had adverse economic and educational impacts on states across the country and on countries across the world, especially especially in those states and countries with significant numbers of individuals who have gotten sick from and or die from the virus. Whereas no state with significant numbers of individuals who have gotten sick from and or died from the virus can address the attendant effects without federal support. Whereas Congress has acknowledged this fact with the passage of coronavirus relief bills in the last two months. Whereas these bills now law, while helpful and appreciated, are insufficient to shield our children and families from, from profound and whereas no child asked to grow up in a pandemic and to the absolute extent possible no child should be harmed in his or her education by the fact that he or she did not grow up in in part during a pandemic now therefore be it resolved that the state board of education does hereby urge the michigan state legislature and the michigan congressional delegation to support 
actively, individually, and collectively a bill to preserve educational services to Michigan school children that have been threatened as a result of this pandemic, and be it further resolved that the State Board of Education urges members of the state education community to share their related thoughts with members of the Michigan State Legislature and with members of the Michigan Congressional Delegation and to urge their national associations to share similarly with members of Congress. Thank you very much, uh, President Albrich. Um, if there are no more questions or comments about the base resolution, and I'll pause there for a moment to see if there are. Um, if there are not, uh, then uh, Mr. McMillan, uh, we will entertain uh, your motions uh, one by one. Okay, um, I would make a motion. Uh, <clears throat> my motion is to amend the uh, result paragraph after the word pandemic to say as long as State Superintendent Dr. Rice can prove publicly that all Michigan Department of Education employees receiving full time or 95% pay for work done remotely during the governor's declared state of emergency has in fact done full time work each day they have been paid. Okay, uh, so we have a motion by Mr. McMillan. Do we have a second? Uh, I heard a second. Um, do we have discussion on the motion? Yeah, I would like to, uh, you know, Please. discuss uh, my motion. I think that's appropriate. Of course. Um, I, uh, you know, I just, I think that uh, the public should be able to know that, you know, people getting paid um, are doing the work. And I don't have any reason to believe that it's not. Uh, being done, um, maybe even being done more, but I still think that um, you know, for for public or for for uh, business, for private entities, they have a uh, incentive to conserve money. They have a profit motive. They have to stay in business. So there's a real incentive to make sure that people are getting paid, are doing the work, and that's just not there. That that uh, profit incentive. Uh, or trying to stay in business incentive isn't there for government. So I think, you know, it's um, well, and especially if the EO said that uh, people can't have to be paid whether or not they're doing their work. Uh, I, I just I think that uh, we should have some kind of accountability publicly that uh, that people are being are doing the work that they're getting paid for. OK, thank you very much. Dr. Pugh, a comment? Yeah, um, and and um, Tom, I have a great deal of respect for you, and I hope that I can maintain that this year. I think um, that you are not giving credit to the fact that we are in a pandemic. We have people whose lives are being lost. I've lost a family member. Others have lost family members. We are trying our best to hold it together as we, and, and, and I want you to know, you know, as a person who has for, for, most of my uh, uh, career work as a government official and I've worked and I'll use a good word. I've worked my behind off and I know that these people who we're talking about right now are doing the same. They are keeping our children and their families together while they are going through a pandemic, a crisis of, of a magnitude. And this has not obviously impacted you or your family in the same way as others, but people are losing lives. People are trying to hold it together while they're uh, in their homes. We have these educators, we have this department, and we have children and family who uh, need the help and we and need the support of us. They need the support of us as this board. Uh, we do not need to be putting or even talking as if we think that an extra burden needs to be put on them. I'm, I'm ashamed to even be having this discussion. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pugh. Other uh, comments or thoughts regarding uh, Mr. McMillan's first um, amendment? Um, we have a comment, uh, Ms. Fecto. I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. Ms. ramos Montini on the phone, I beg your pardon. She 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 texted me. She doesn't have access to the chat. Ms. Ramos Montini, then Ms. Fecto. I beg your pardon. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, well, you know, the pandemic has truly identified the budget that we together for years to come. The pandemic is in control. And so it is now that we have to get our resources together, our act together to continue educating our students. Now, I think the work that has been demonstrated just in this meeting by the Michigan Department of Education under the leadership of Superintendent Rice is more than a testimony that the work that the department and all the individuals that work for the department are doing their job. There is no space in my mind to indicate that this is not being done. And so we together, together, everybody, the, the state government, the legislature, the Michigan Department of Education, everybody, everybody, all educators are working together to make this work. This is a new frontier for all of us. And, and I have all the faith in the world that we are going to get out of this situation sooner or later. But right now we're building the, the block to make that happen. And so I will not be voting for this resolution. I will be voting in opposition of, of this resolution to, of this amendment to the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ramos Montigny. Ms. Fecto, then Ms. Snyder. Hi, um, I have the um, privilege of being in the house of teachers right now when I see them working every single day. They regularly have meetings with their supervisors and report on everything they do. They track every student they talk to. They give information about all the work that the students are doing. And I really think we should leave it to the local, the local communities to oversee the work of their employees and make the decisions on um, who's working and who's not and manage it at the local level. So I feel a, a little funny saying local control to you, Tom, but um, I, I do, I see that there is a lot of uh, connection with these uh, districts and their supervisors and uh, this reporting structure. Um, I see my husband uh, and my daughter on the phone at all hours of the night because most of these high school kids don't answer in the morning. They are up in the middle of the night. So he's up in the middle of the night helping them with their homework and responding to them. So it's not like a nine to five kind of a thing, but they do report regularly to their supervisors. They have at least one meeting a week where they talk about what they're doing, plan for the future, how to fill in the gaps. Um, and, uh, I, and I see, you know, just great concern and um, for get, doing a good job being uneasy about not what the future is going to hold, but doing the best they can and working really, really hard. Um, I also don't know who would oversee at the state level this accountability, how many people that would employ, um, how much it, it, what it would, what kind of a structure that would be. Um, and it seems like an unnecessary bureaucratic expense when we at the local levels are, are taking care of these types of issues. Um, so I, I, I understand the need for um, wanting to ensure money is well spent. I think that's an honorable goal. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but I think it, we have to um, entrust our local school boards, our local um, administrators, and our, we have to trust our local teachers um, to a certain degree right now. Um, so that's... That's my two cents on the on the, this amendment and the one to come to follow. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Fecto. Ms. Snyder. Yes, I just, I kind of want to direct my attention to the public just briefly. Sorry for the bickering back and forth that you're hearing right now. Truly, I think that everybody who's sitting at the board table, everybody at the Michigan Department of Education, teachers, administrators, like Michelle just said, we are all doing definitely the best that we can in the midst of a pandemic, but we're not gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call y'all Pam here. We're not gonna shame each other. 
for talking about the things that are important as we go through that work. Because the way we go about our work right now, not just what we're doing, the 10 and 11 hour, hour work days, 12, 16, 18 hours for some people, healthcare workers are punching in. They don't get paid until they punch in and punch out. Many of them are working on hot floors, which are dealing directly with exactly what we're talking about, the pandemic. Um, some nurses, many nurses are being laid off because that ev all of the attention has been focused right there in the pandemic and where we're at. And so instead of bickering like this, we're not going to do that. It's okay and reasonable for us to suggest amendments. Um, like Michelle, you said, it is honorable. It is honorable to say we're going to carry out this very important work right now, and we're going to carry it out in a way that's fiscally responsible. We're not going to bicker with each other or bite each other's backs about whether or not these types of questions should be raised and answered. And so I'm pretty firm about that. I, I seconded the amendment because I think it's important to suggest to the public, please look at the work we're doing and know that we're doing it with fidelity for you and with you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Snyder. Um, any other comments or uh, reflections on the First Amendment by Mr. McMillan? Okay. Hearing um, or seeing none, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Snyder, Marilyn Snyder, if you would be kind enough to uh, do a roll call vote on Mr. McMillan's First Amendment to the resolution. I'm happy to. Facto? No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? No. Pugh? No. Ramos Montini? No. Snyder? Yes. I did not catch that. Nikki? Yes. Thank you. Tilly? No. Thank you. Albridge? No. Two yes, six no. Motion fails. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll go to... Um, sec uh, second, second motion, Mr. Uh, McMillan. Yeah, I'm going to go to amendment number three. As long as there exists, this is right after a pandemic, as long as there exists no opportunity to cut sufficient funds from other departments. Um, I'd like to add, including corporate welfare that's given out by the MEDC uh, in the state of Michigan's government uh, to make up for the perceived education funding needed. Can I ask a question? The word pandemic appears multiple times in this resolution. Can you be a little more specific of what, where? It says in the first resolve paragraph after the word pandemic, there's only one pandemic in the first resolve paragraph. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have a we have a motion on the table by uh, Mr. McMillan. Is there a second? Can you just give me a, a moment? I'm trying to catch up to find these amendments. Okay, I think I just found them. And and I I don't think I oh. And and you said this is number three, Tom. Yeah. I second that. I second that. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. And uh, let's pause just for a moment so that we, so that everybody is on the same page. Everybody's able to reflect on the third amendment uh, by Mr. McMillan. These were sent to you, board members, early this morning. And and again, Mr. McMillan, perhaps if you could reread that for the listening public. Uh, yeah, so uh, the third amendment would, in, or the second one would be in the first, uh, my amendment would say in the first resolve paragraph after pandemic add, quote, as long as there exists no opportunity to cut sufficient funds from other departments, including uh, corporate welfare by the MEDC, in the state of Michigan's government uh, to make up for the perceived education funding needed. Okay. 
All right. Very good. Um, is there any, um, I see a, a question uh, by Ms. Fecto and then a comment by uh, President Albrecht. Ms. Fecto. Okay. Um, so there exists no opportunity um, it, to cut sufficient funds. There's always an opportunity to cut funds. It might not be a good decision. It might not be wise, but there's always an opportunity to cut funds. So I think that language is overly broad because I wouldn't want to, for instance, cut funds to support foster kids. Um, it doesn't say, it doesn't put any parameters on it. So I think it's as if you're saying, you know, given a carte blanche, if there's any place we can cut funds, we should do that before we even ask for more funding from the feds. It doesn't say it's a, a, a good decision. <laughs> it just says just an opportunity to. So. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, that was it, that was it. Good. Okay, President Albridge. Thank you. I would just point out that, that um, under our system of government it is the legislature that appropriates funds and this is beyond the control of the State Board of Education. So to tie our own hands based on the actions or inactions of others, I think is, is extremely unfair and uh, it does not allow us to be uh, engaged in our constitutional responsibility to the state. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions or anything to add in discussion of the third of uh, Mr. McMillan's um, uh, proposed amendments, the no, second on which we are, the second which we have considered. I'm yeah. sorry, Mr. McMillan? Yeah, I do. I mean, we are um, being asked to vote on a resolution asking for more money. And, um, you know, if we want to change the word to cut sufficient funds to, uh, to cut less important funds, that's fine. Um, I'll make that amendment um, with the second's approval. Um, but, you know, I mean, again, I don't think we would be asking for additional funds if we if uh, we could cut corporate welfare and it was sufficient, uh, which uh, I think we give billions to, um, you know, give billions out in, in in some corporate welfare forms or another. So I um, I guess this would just impact you know, how I would vote on this resolution if we're saying give us money no matter what, or are we saying give us money as long as you've cut everything that's not as important as education, or as long as you've uh, tried, to, tried to not, um, you know, tried to not, you know, uh, you know tax uh, our citizens more or uh, something like that. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. McMillan. Other uh, other comments or reflections? Um, President Albrecht, is that a hand? It is. Okay. Uh, I would just like to point out the language of the resolution is not asking for money. It is asking for a preservation of educational services to Michigan school children. Um, so that is just a clarification on what this resolution is actually requesting. So you're not asking for more money? We are asking for a preservation of education, which basically means don't slash educational funding to the point where kids no longer have access to a proper education. So you're not asking the feds to give more money? I'll read it one more time. We are asking to preserve educational services to Michigan school children that have been threatened as a result of this pandemic. A preservation, not more. <laughs> All right. So, so let the record, let the record show that, that they don't want more money for the from the vet. Cut us. That somehow that means we're asking for more money. I think we have a disagreement in in that respect. We are not asking for for more than what we have today. We are asking that the schools not be cut to the point where they can't provide educational services to kids. I don't think the feds are, are proposing to cut 
funds, I think that you're asking for the feds to provide more money. But if you're not, then let the record show that they're not, that this is not a request for more money from the feds. The record shows exactly what the resolution says, which is to preserve educational services to Michigan school children. Okay. The, um, thank you, uh, President Albrecht. Ms. Snyder. Actually, Tom just clarified what I was, I was. Okay, all right, very good. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Um, anyone else on um, the third uh, motion? Um, second on which we will have voted. Hearing, uh, hearing nothing uh, additionally. Um, Marilyn Schneider, if you'd be kind enough to do a roll call vote, please. Yes. Facto? No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? No. Hugh? No. Ramos Montini? No. Snyder? Yes. yes. Tilly? No. Albrich? No. Two yeses, six noes, motion fails. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. McMillan? Yeah, I'll move on. Just uh, the what I had labeled uh, Amendment 4, I was good, is uh, after the, in the first result paragraph after pandemic, insert as long as the federal government does not lay the additional costs of this funding on the backs of students in the form of additional debt, but rather will cut other government spending equivalent to the perceived education funding needed. And I'll add, uh, in order to preserve educational services to M Michigan school children. Okay, thank you very much. We have a motion on the table. Do we have a second? I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Do we have discussion on the motion? This is the fourth as written. It is the third as considered in our uh, public board meeting. Do we have discussion on the motion? Mr. McMillan, would you like to share additionally? Uh, just that, uh, well, I mean, now that I guess it's been clear by the president that they're not Ask, they don't want the feds to give any additional money, just not cut what they were going to give. Um, maybe this isn't needed, but I think uh, just because I'm, I think that this will be perceived as uh, the word funding is is in here. So I'm, I'm guessing it's perceived that it's going to be a request for more money from the feds. Uh, so it's just saying that uh, cut elsewhere. I mean, cut corporate welfare, cut uh, which. Democrat and Republican presidents have all supported and Dem Democrat and Republican legislators have all supported and I've, I've always argued that should be cut. So, you know, cut corporate welfare, cut other, cut war, a lot of the, you know, forever wars that we've got going on, cut other places, but uh, don't lay additional debt on our kids. Okay, um, thank you very much, Mr. McMillan. Any other um, thoughts or questions on this? Uh, motion. This is, an, is the fourth amendment as written, the third amendment as considered. Ms. Fecto. Um, yeah, and by the way, my computer is going in and out, so I hopefully you can. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I, I do agree that there's um, way too many tax credits. Um, I point to Dan Gilbert as evident as a uh, uh, prime example, but um, I also see that the debt that the students will be having, the debt of education, the debt of not being, you know, um, being able to have the education they need to become full and productive adults later on is a, as, a, as a debt that they're going to have on their backs, whether it's, um, yeah. you know, taxes or no taxes. Uh, and so I I think that's a more immediate concern, even though I do understand, Tom, what you're saying. And um, I do agree that we give way too many tax credits to businesses that don't fulfill their promises. 
Um, uh, I would like to tackle that in another way, another day, but uh, the, I think the, it's an urgent need right now to make sure these kids get a, as best education as we can give them. Thank you, Ms. Fecto. Other, uh, other comments or thoughts regarding Mr. McMillan's fourth um, proposed amendment as written, third proposed amendment as considered? Dr. Pugh, a comment. Following up to uh, Michelle, and then I think that this uh, goes along with the third amendment and this amendment. Um, Tom, I, I too appreciate uh, the spirit of, of the conversation around the uh, corporate uh, credits, um, but I think that I don't want to give across a signal that we're not talking the need for both and as these conversations have a long been going on. This is we, we're not just starting these conversations, but I don't want to uh, signal that we're saying uh, don't cut unless we need to preserve, and we also need for uh, that funding that belongs in K through 12 education to come to K to K through 12 education. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Other um, other reflections, comments, or questions on the fourth amendment as written, the third amendment as considered by Mr. McMillan. Hearing and seeing none, uh, Marilyn Schneider, if we you would be kind enough to do a roll call vote, please. I will. Facto? No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? No. Q? No. Ramos Montini? No. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? No. Albrecht? No. Two yes, six no, amendment fails. Thank you, uh, Ms. Schneider. Uh, Mr. McMillan, um, to you for your, uh, your last proposed amendment. Um, I think I'm good. Okay, thank you very much. So what, what we have is we have the, the base resolution as initially uh, introduced. Um, just some uh, clarity um, around uh, terms. Uh, this resolution seeks to make sure that educational services for children in the state of Michigan do not deteriorate off the 2019-2020 base. Dr. Pugh referred to persistent underfunding of public schools in the state of Michigan. We would be remiss if we did not note that there have been six studies in six years that have said the same thing, beginning with the Upjohn Institute study of 2015, 2016 study, that was authorized by the state legislature, the 2017 study that was co-chaired by Lieutenant Governor Calley, 2018 School Finance Research Collaborative study, 2019 study by Professor David Arson, the 2020 study just a couple of months ago by Ed Trust Midwest. They've all said the same thing. Different children have different needs, different needs have different costs, and Michigan has persistently underfunded children in public schools. That's not my opinion, although it is my opinion. That's what six studies in six years have said. But we are not talking about the persistent underfunding of public schools in this resolution, although that is enormously important and that remains a huge issue in the state of Michigan. In this resolution, we are talking about that revenue base not deteriorating further. Dr. Pugh references the fact that from 1995 to 2015, our total revenue growth in the country, Michigan's total revenue growth in the country was 50th of 50 on an inflation adjusted basis. You can't get much worse than worst. And that's what we've been persistently since Prop A has gone into effect. Yep. We've underfunded our public schools and underfunded them persistently. 
This resolution says, Congress, don't permit a pandemic to adversely affect our children. No child asked to be born and to grow up in a pandemic. No child should be adversely affected to the extent of our ability to prevent uh, from happening. No child should be adversely affected in their education by growing up in the midst of a pandemic. That's what this resolution says. This is a resolution in support of safeguarding our children as a State Board of Education. So with that said, uh, Ms. Schneider, hearing well, no other I, uh, comments, uh, well, if you could take a, there a big part, Mr. McMillan. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I'm a little bit conflicted because I had heard the president say that they're not going to be asking for funding and that's not what this is requesting from the Fed. So if that were the case, I'd, you know, I might, and if I could understand that in the resolution, I'd, I'd be more inclined to maybe even support it. I, I kind of think it probably is asking for money. Um, and so, and also since my amendments were rejected, if I don't have any assurance or if I can't assure the public, if I'm not able to assure the public that uh, the state is spending their money well, that they're, you know, that, the, that, Governor Whitmer is going to cut corporate welfare uh, and other make other cuts uh, to try to lessen, uh, you know, any problems um, with funding. Uh, there's nothing in here that prohibits a tax increase on the people of Michigan. So that may be what ends up happening. Um, and that I, you know, I, if I knew the feds were going to cut corporate welfare and, you know, some uh, endless wars and, and all the other, uh, a lot of problems and, and frivolous spending at the federal level and and not lay additional debt on kids uh, and grandkids, you know, it might be something that I could even support. I don't know. Uh, I don't know where this money is going to come from. So I don't know that I could say no, because, again, the money might be from cuts uh, the, you know, the feds might do the wise thing. Governor Whitmer might uh, cut corporate welfare. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe there will be a, a, an interest in publicly assuring the public that um, all 50,000 state employees are, you know, uh, working, um, you know, full time jobs for full time pay. Um, not that it, not that that's not happening now, but I'm just saying that, uh, you know, maybe that assurance uh, might have happened. So I don't know that I want to say no either. So it don't don't really like passing, but um, when you've got a when you've got a resolution that's pretty unclear, I guess I I'm really left with no choice. Well, and I think I think to President Albrecht's earlier uh, point, this is not a uh, this is not asking for a net increase. Although one could certainly argue for a net increase, rather it is uh, for the purpose of indicating that in the midst of a pandemic, state revenues are going to decline and we want revenues uh, from the feds to increase so as to hold our children harmless in the midst of a pandemic. The net effect of this would be, um, would be a wash in terms of our ability to support services for children. In other words, children would be unharmed in their educational service delivery within the midst of a pandemic but there would nonetheless be a funding shift. And um, I, I think we're, we're all clear about the difference between um, growth shifts in revenue and net shifts in uh, revenue. Um, any other um, uh, reflections? Uh, Ms. Snyder. Just one more thing to add to Tom's comment. Um, you know, you simultaneously simultaneously say thank you to Congress for the CARES Act, of which we haven't quite, again, figured out the whole breakdown of those dollars and how that moves out, if you will. Um, but then also, Congress, please don't cut funding. They're not doing that. They haven't done that. So it's just, it's not just that it's not a clear resolution. It's, it's, a, it's a request to not do something that they're literally doing the opposite of, which doesn't quite make sense, just to throw it out there. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Snyder. And just uh, from, from the perspective of clarity, the CARES Act funding is uh, just shy of $390 million for pre-K-12 public schools in the state of Michigan. 
uh, if we were to have a $1.5 billion uh, gap in our school aid fund, uh, you're talking about four times the CARES Act funding. So we appreciate the CARES Act uh, revenue. It is helpful, but it will by no means uh, safeguard us from very, very profound cuts associated with our uh, young people. And I think this will become pretty clear in three days in the mid-May revenue estimating uh, conference. Any other uh, questions or comments uh, from or by state board members on the base resolution? Hearing none, uh, Ms. Schneider, Ms. Marilyn Schneider, if you would be kind enough to uh, do a roll call vote, please, on the base resolution as introduced. Thank you. Yes. Secto? Yes. McMillan? Pass. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Ramos Montini? Yes. Snyder? I pass as well. Thank you. Thank you. Tilly? Yes. Albrich? Yes. I have six yeses, two passes, motion carries. Thank you very much, Marilyn. The next item on today's agenda is discussion slash action on resolution regarding Gary B versus Governor Whitmer et al. Uh, and I will turn this over to uh, President Albrich. President Albrich. Uh, thank you. I think before we start discussion, I would like to make a motion that we approve the resolution establishing the State Board of Education's position in Gary B. et al. B. Gretchen Whitmer et al. Support. We have a motion and a second. Uh, discussion, uh, President Albrich. Uh, yes, I will start by reading the resolution. The resolution states, a uh, resolution establishing the State Board of Education's position in Gary B. et al. v. Gretchen Whitmer et al. Whereas on April 23, 2020, the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit issued an opinion in Gary B. et al. v. Gretchen Whitmer et al. number 18-1855, in which the panel majority held that the United States Constitution provides a fundamental right to a basic minimum education. And whereas on May May 6, 2020, without an affirmative vote by the majority of the members of the State Board of Education authorizing their action, board members Tom McMillan and Nikki Snyder sued in their official capacity as board members in Gary B, filed a petition for rehearing and bonk in Gary B, asking the full Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals to rehear the case and reject the panel majority's conclusion, finding a fundamental right to a basic minimum education. And whereas pursuant to MC CL 388.1004, the board speaks with one voice and transacts its business through affirmative votes by a majority of the members serving on the board. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the State Board of Education, one, supports the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals panel majority's conclusion that the United States Constitution provides a fundamental right to a basic minimum education. Two, does not support or authorize the filing of a petition for on bunk rehearing of the panel majority's April 23rd, 2020 decision, and three, designates President Cassandra Albridge to discuss the Gary B. et al. v. Gretchen Whitmer et al. case with the Michigan Department of Attorney General, authorizes President Cassandra Albridge to request on behalf of the board guidance and advice from the Attorney General's office relating to the Gary B. case and designates President Cassandra Albridge to authorize filings by the Attorney General's office on behalf of the board consistent with supporting a fundamental right to a basic minimum education. Thank you, President Albridge. Um, is, there any, um, is there any comment on the base resolution? And um, if not, we'll move yeah. into amendments. We have, we have two people that would like to offer amendments. Uh, Mr. McMillan and Dr. Pugh, but I, I, any comment on the base resolution before we move into amendments? Uh, Mr. McMillan, you have a comment? Yeah, I would just uh, like to say that, you know, the second whereas talks about an, without an affirmative vote. Um, Ms. Snyder and I 
requested on Bonk, we, you know, we were doing nothing that we had, you know, that uh, we were arguing nothing that, that hadn't been argued in the past and that this board, uh, you know, a majority of the board at least agreed with us uh, doing. So, you know, um, the on, the request for on Bonk is simply saying, look, you 15 judges, you, you delegated your authority to three. Uh, we're just asking that, you know, you, uh, you go back and all, all 15 of you make a decision instead of just the delegation of three. The rules allow uh, any party to do that. We were, we're a party. Uh, and so we just followed court rules. So it's not, um, you know, like I said, we're not, we weren't doing anything that this board didn't already allow us to do in the past. Um, and so I, I wanted to say that first. Um, you know, my amendment's only going to, it's only going to strike the last two paragraphs of the resolve. So, I mean, I might, I'd like to just speak to the resolution as a whole, you know, to, to approve this resolution and to, to let the, uh, the decision stand, uh, the, the three, uh, the two, one decision, what you're, I, I want to make sure that those are going to support this will own what happens. So what is going to happen is a George W. Bush appointee, uh, Judge Murphy, is going to become the de facto emergency manager over a significant portion of the Detroit education system. Uh, that is what you will be authorizing uh, by not going forward uh, and by approving this. You are take you are authorizing the removal of local control uh and not even to go to state control but to go to federal one 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 person's uh you know control over a significant portion of the education system in detroit <clears throat> and further this judge uh, may require the state to give significant money hundreds of millions who knows um he may not but he might the result of that may mean that um, other districts will lose funding because of this. So you supporters of this resolution need to own the fact that when other districts are complaining about cuts coming because uh, more money was taken out of the school aid fund to go to this to any costs that, um, you know, it had to be cut elsewhere potentially, or it had to be cut somewhere else in the state. But, uh, you know, conceivably it will come out of this this school aid fund. So, you know, I, I think there are good reasons to allow this to move forward. Um, and I, you know, I would hope that, you know, the resolution as it stands now will not move forward and not would be will not be approved. Um, although if, you know, I certainly understand that a majority may want the first uh, resolved, you know, a, uh, supporting the the appeals panel, but I don't feel that it needs to necessarily do the second and third paragraphs in the result uh, section. And that will be my amendment when when the appropriate time arises. Thank you very much, McMillan. Any other broad comments on the base resolution as uh, introduced and seconded? Base comments on the base resolution. OK, hearing hearing none, um, we have at least I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. We have uh, we have two comments on the base resolution, Ms. Fecto and then Ms. Snyder. Yeah, <clears throat> well, as the only person here that lives in Detroit um, and has raised children in Detroit, um, I I think it's a, I see this and I think you bring up some good points, Tom, but I see this as an opportunity to do something about the status quo. Um, I have lost my faith in the legislature to find the political will to look out for the children in Detroit and other communities like Detroit um, to really ensure that all they have is a basic education. Just, a, I mean, it's the, the, the ability to read literacy, something I think many people on this board have expressed a, a keen interest in ensuring um, you know, I'm not sure, you know, what that will come to look like. I know in other states when there've been court hearings, they've had to work with the governor and the legislature to ensure that this was done, um, that they came up with a plan to ensure it was done. Um, I just know that 
I see this as a historic point. To, if we can ensure that you know children have these rights, I wish our state constitution mirrored other state constitutions, which provided rights to an adequate or effective education. We have not. We do not have that in our constitution. We have a very weak uh, mandate when it comes to education, which I think has really hurt us. And so that's why I think the you know the need to go to the federal courts. But, um, you know, I would rather take the gamble um, with this, where the goal is not to balance a budget like the other managers that came in here who are political appointees with different agendas. I, the goal is, and the mandate of the court is to provide, um, you know, basic education uh, and the right to literacy. So I think with that goal in mind, not simply to correct the books, regardless of how it affects the students, which is what we put up with with these managers. Um, I, I, I think it's worth um, uh, settling and with the goal of providing um, literacy. Um, I, I think um, it's an opportunity and I, and I want to be on the side of supporting that goal. Thank you, Ms. Fecto, Ms. Snyder. Thanks, Michael. I, I do think this is an important case and it's building into a highly controversial conversation. So I just want to make sure that, especially after Michelle's last comment, this is a gamble. It's, it's an important gamble to define so that the public can understand. And we need to be following the dynamics of it closely. But, you know, when I think of it, I think of the appropriate literary me metaphor of you can't judge a book by its cover. So in this case, the cover of is there a constitutional right to literacy? Anyone who disagrees is kind of painted and perceived with great horror, but you really need to open that book and explore it further. Every person on this board was voted for and elected because we all agree that kids need to learn to read. We've actively worked together to improve access to literacy and we'll continue to do that. Honestly, we've worked feverishly with partnership districts and in the name of returning control to local boards and preserving state sovereignty through advocating for our own state board authority. So now our members are about to lead inconsistently and effectively silence opposing voices championing that very foundation. That's what this case is about. It's not about whether we have a strong board with all eight of us agreeing that there is an issue with literacy in our state and that there are problems that need solving, but that we believe those solutions are not just best in the hands of local boards and state government, but that this is what is constitutional. That's the gamble right there. Not a federal judge acting as a new emergency manager. To learn to read is the foundation of a good life, of a civic life, we talk about that in the case, but it's also the foundation of discerning whether or not you've come across a bad cover title and a bad narrative. I personally want every child in our state to learn to read, and I'm not gonna stop fighting for that, uh, regardless of, of the outcome. And all I can say is we'll keep working together, but I'm not going to back down from that bad cover title or the narrative. Because the title of the book is not, is literacy a right? It's when public education was turned over to another emergency manager, a federally appointed judge. That's the gamble. And I'm not willing to take it. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Snyder. Um, any other comments from any other uh, board members on the base resolution? Uh, yeah, Michael. Yes. Uh, let me just briefly say that I, I too agree with the word gamble that Michelle mentioned that this, you know, by turning this resolution or supporting the resolution, it really is a gamble. Um, you know, the plaintiffs, one of the things they asked for was the statewide accountability system, which we as a, all eight of us have fought unanimously. Now there is one, but who knows what that, what this, uh, you know, the judge may decide uh, is a more appropriate. Uh, maybe it's going to be a lot more high stakes based. Who knows? This could end up being a real problem. And, and you know, I just want to say that, I mean, I hope you all will own it uh, because by not allowing us to do, uh, you know, what, what you have said we could do in the past, all we're asking is that uh, we maintain our our uh, position that that you all allowed us to to uh, file in in the brief uh, with with all with every, with all the parties, um, you know, I mean that that it's really going to end up being um, 
one one person, this one judge. So, you know, I um, I also we you know we need to know that it's not it's not going to stop at Detroit. There's going to be a plethora of other lawsuits probably followed in in this uh, circuit, uh, including throughout Michigan potentially. So, you know, the money that may be drained um, and may be drained for things that we would disagree with, um, you know, from the school aid fund could be even more significant. Um, and, and so I just, I think that, you know, really, I don't want education in Detroit or anywhere to be decided by a federal judge that's appointed, you know, and I mean, appointed by George W. Bush, I mean, or by any uh, president, I, I wouldn't want. Um, I think that the local school district should be making that decision, the local school uh, superintendent, um, the people should have a say, and to take it away from them, um, I don't, I'm, I'm surprised that, that y'all are in voting for this, but. Okay, so um, we don't have a um, an amendment on the table yet. Okay. Um, we've been talking Can about I, the base resolution. You want if me to put an amendment? I, I would very much like you to okay. put your amendment up and then we can get a second and discuss the amendment. Okay, so I understand that this board would want to, uh, you know, come out saying that, you know, the, the first wherefore or uh, resolved supporting the panel's majority conclusion, providing a, a fundamental right to basic level, minimum education. I would move that we strike the second and third paragraphs of that resolve. And you're, you're recommending the striking of uh, let's read the two paragraphs, please. Uh, does not support or authorize. OK, OK, now therefore be resolved that the State Board of Education and I'm, I'm my amendment would strike number two does not support or authorize the filing of a petition sorry, of a petition uh, for on banc rehearing of the panel majorities April 23rd, 2020 decision and number three designates President Cassandra Elbridge to discuss the Gary B et al. versus Gretchen Whitmer et al. case with the uh, Michigan Department of Attorney General authorizes President Cassandra Elbridge to request on behalf of the board guidance and advice from the Attorney General's office relating to the Gary B case and designates President Cassandra Elbridge to authorize filings by the Attorney General's office on behalf of the board consistent with supporting a fundamental right to a basic minimum education. OK, very good. So we've got a motion. Do we have a second? Yes, I second that. OK, we have a motion and a second discussion on the motion. Mr. McMillan, any additional discussion? No, I, I just, you know, I think this board can take a stand, um, but also allow us to just continue doing what you said we could do in the past and uh, just ask instead of three judges that all 15 make a decision. Um, and, and decide on this. OK, very good. Um, any other um, any other reflections before we vote? Board members? And one more bite of the apple. Um, we have a. Um, um, I, it looks like we've got a comment from uh, Dr. Pugh. Is that correct? That's true. I was trying to wave my hands over here. I guess it's a delay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I don't know which one goes <laughs> so um, in reference to the second paragraph, uh, I, I would say that that should stand because uh, Tom uh, nor Nikki have uh, standing uh, in the court to file on behalf of the state uh, board of education. They can do that in their as individuals voice, uh, raise their voice and, and, and be a voice for that other side. But this paragraph here is, is, is truthful and factual. OK, thank you, Dr. Pugh. Other um, other reflections? Well, before? well, I, I'll just say that if if Dr. Pugh would uh, want me to leave number two, I could just remove number three if she would be interested in that. I mean, uh, yeah. Okay, we have a, uh, uh, a tentative proposal for a friendly amendment as we deal with relaxed Robert rules of order. <laughs> I didn't understand the amendment to the pro proposed friendly amendment. 
Well, I would just I would say that uh, only number three would be removed and not number two. If you said that number two, you'd like to stay in there. Um, I would just, you know, I'm open to leaving number two in there and just taking out number three. But I, I, I don't understand how by law you take either one of these these out. Uh, so. Um, well, I do have we do have standing. I mean, we're all it requires to add is we're talking about a rule 35. We're not talking about we're not appealing. We're just taking we're just we're all rule 35 uh, requires is that we that a party that I be a party and we're a party We're we're named in the lawsuit individually. So uh, we're not violating uh, rule 35. We're not doing anything. That's uh, you know, we're just it's a it's a rule. So it, yeah, and, I, and, and it's unfortunate. These conversations are kind of hard because you almost leave, need our legal um, uh, uh, arm to be here. But I don't think that we act uh, on our own. We act. We, we are being sued uh, by seven uh, children who unfortunately had to take us to court to sue us to get a right, basic right to education uh, as in our official capacity, not as individuals. So I don't see how you take either of those two, two items out. Okay, um, we we have a motion, we have a second, we have some discussion. Any additional discussion? Mm -hmm. Dr. Pugh, additional discussion? I will just say that, that that's from legal, uh, um, a legal uh, advising that I received. Fair so enough. I don't see how that comes out. Okay, thank okay. you. Uh, Mr. McMillan, anything additional? Um, no, I like I said, I mean, I, no, no, not on the amendment. No. OK, anything else from the other six board members on the amendment? Strictly on the amendment as offered by Mr. McMillan. Hearing nothing else, uh, Marilyn Schneider, if you would be kind enough to take our uh, roll call vote, please. Uh, yes. Facto? No. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? No. Pugh? No. Ramos Montini? No. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? No. Albrecht? No. No. Two yes, six no, amendment fails. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Pugh, you would like to offer an amendment as well? Yes, and you know, I, this is a very well-written resolution and um, I, I do appreciate the board uh, taking this position and, and supporting our children and supporting the ruling uh, of, of the Sixth Circuit Court. Uh, my question is, and, and my uh, uh, proposed um, amendment would be to the last paragraph and uh, just adding, if, if I could be added to uh, Cassandra to discuss the Gary Biatal uh, case with the Michigan Department of Attorney General. So we have a motion on the, uh, the floor from Dr. Pugh. Um, do we have a second associated there with? Second. Second from um, Lupe. board member Lupe Ramos Montini. Uh, discussion associated there with Dr. Pugh. And, and I always um, appreciate and definitely <clears throat> yield to uh, President uh, uh, Albrecht um, just being around the case and on, on this um, side with the plaintiffs um, having various questions and knowledge about the case. I just would like to be uh, a backup uh, for with uh, Dr. Uh, Albridge. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Pugh. Other, uh, other reflections on um, Dr. Pugh's uh, motion? Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Um, while I certainly appreciate uh, Dr. Pugh's passion, um, I'm, 
I would be concerned about adding an additional name there only because the president of the board, duly elected by the board members, uh, is the spokesperson, uh, is also our voice not only in negotiations, I think back a year ago when we uh, made the decision to hire Dr. Rice, but in certainly in legal matters. And it's been my experience uh, uh, it, throughout uh, school districts in particular dealing with boards of education that it is the president uh, solely who is um, uh, should be involved in that. Uh, as Dr. Pugh indicated, uh, Cassandra is open uh, and keeps us very well informed, but um, I would be concerned about adding an additional name there, uh, not the name, but more the protocol, keeping the protocol to one person being the president of the board. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pritchett. Uh, Ms. Fecto. Um, yeah, it, this is... Um I thought about this because I think the world of um, Pam and Cassandra, um, but I think um, I think there's an understanding that Cassandra will bring in Dr. Um, Pugh and she will be part of the discussions as she's been um, a real champion on this issue. But I think I will um, uh, go with what um, second what Judy said, I think for um, clarity to have the point person be Cassandra, what, what with the understanding that Cassandra, and I know she's very open to it, having um, Pam be involved with this, um, I, that's that's uh, the position I would support. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hello. Fecto. Thank you, Ms. Fecto. Um, Ms., uh, Ms. Ramos Montini and then Dr. Albridge. Okay, heaven second the motion. I, I I really believe that both Cassandra and Pam will be a a a team will be a duo to uh, move this agenda forward. And I think both of them have been engaged in uh, 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 seriously about this issue in 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 different ways. And and so I think. Uh, combining the two names to the document only uh, makes it stronger and uh, with a stronger voice. And I think at the end of the day, Cassandra will be the one to record, uh, but Pam's uh, name will be there as, as a as a a, uh, a two person uh, president and vice president to speak in our behalf. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ramos Montini, uh, Dr. Obrich, and then uh, Mr. McMillan. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, I have no problem bringing others to the table, uh, but there's a difference between bringing folks to the table and putting it in the resolution. Um, if you put it in the resolution, then there needs to be some additional uh, material in there, such as what happens if um, Pam and I give the attorney Attorney General's office different guidance. Who outweighs who? Uh, you know, there's there's other considerations that would need to be um, taken into consideration if we were to to do this. And so I would just add uh, ask that that um, be part of the conversation. Okay, thank you, Dr. Albrich. Mr. McMillan. Uh, you know, I would support this amendment. Um, uh, one of the reasons because I'm not. You know, I, I have extremely strong uh, respect for Dr. Elbridge. I'm not even sure we can do this. Uh, I know that we can authorize like the president to sign documents, uh, you know, like uh, the agreement with uh, Dr. Rice when we hired him and, you know, ministerial, I think the legal phrase might be or administrative roles, but to actually make decisions that this board should be voting on I'm not sure, you know, I mean, we like, for example, we couldn't delegate to one of our members the ability to uh, decide what stand what the next math standards will be. Uh, I don't think we can. I think that would be something that we couldn't do because the board would would want to vote on that. that. That would be something that we should. Now, uh, signing a document perhaps uh, might be fine. But so again, I'm not exactly sure we can do this, but 
Um, but I think the more the merrier. I think if we put two, if we put three in here, uh, you get closer to, you know, the whole board. I, I, I just am not sure that one person could do it anyway, but I guess two is better than one. That's my thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Mr. McMillan. Dr. Albridge. Um, I thank you for that comment. I would just remind the board that we did this during the A through F conversations as well. Um, the board had given me uh, authority to talk to the attorney general's office um, regarding that. Just a reminder. Yeah, it's not the same. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's the same thing, but okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ms. Fecto. Um, and I, I had to turn off my extra uh, screen because I was unstable, so I'm not looking at the amendment, but. Um, is there some way to phrase it where if we could say um, uh, the, the leadership of the president um, who will be assisted by the vice president or uh, something like that, where it would be, it would name them, but it would make it clear that the, um, the lead on this is coming from Cassandra. Okay, I, I interpret that as a uh, as a friendly amendment to Dr. Pugh, the offer of the motion. Dr. Pugh, your reflection. So, um, yes, we have used this before, and I definitely will always uh, defer to Cassandra and respect her in the role that, that she plays um, as as our president, and would elect her again as our president. I have, I don't. I will take the friendly amendment, but I don't need the friendly amendment to be able to make sure that I follow um, our, the protocol of uh, that that's set by by Cassandra uh, being the president. I think Cassandra brought forward uh, the time that we used this before, which was A through F, and I definitely think that Cassandra understands A through F and so many other topics as it relates to. Um, to education. I, I will uh, I will say um, unabashedly that uh, when it comes to black and brown communities, Michelle, just as you said, you know, you're from Detroit, you know, Detroit. I mean, I just think that that's that we're talking about black and brown communities right now. And I, and I think that uh, there's something to be said about that. Um, we are in an unprecedented time. This is a case uh, we have not uh, seen, I don't think, in this country. And so, um, again, accepting the friendly amendment, but I, I don't need that. I mean, I think for me, it's making sure we have a filter to hear and to listen because I've already seen where there's been times when information that comes from the AG's office, we can interpret it differently uh and so there's there's a lot that that's that's going on um as it relates to to uh making sure that we're staying in communication with the ag's office i would not be moving to make any decisions on my own as i just told you i'm, I'm sure of the fact that i can't make decisions on my own i've gotten a lot of um consultation from the ag's office um so uh i, I just wanted to to mention that So um, from the perspective of uh, clarification, Dr. Pugh, as the mover of the amendment, um, is there an acceptance of Ms. Fecto's proposal as a, a friendly amendment or a, a modification to your base amendment? If she still thinks that that's needed, um, I, I'll say it again. I, I, don't, I, I don't think I've operated in a way where, where that needs to be stated or written, but um, if, if Michelle feels that that's needed to to add uh, to the to the addition of my name, I, I think we just provide some clarity and hopefully resolve um, resolve the, the the matter. Okay, so um, I am going to summarize what I what I just heard. And Dr. Pugh, as the mover, um, you, you need to you need to make uh, sure that that I have appropriately um, got this right. Um, I've got your motion 
um, with a friendly amendment by Ms. Fecto. Um, and um, I don't hear a um, necessarily a disagreement with it. I have to make a determination of whether we're going to be voting on your amendment with her friendly amendment or without. So um, it's kind of a jump ball. I'm hearing more yes than no. Um, so um, is that is that amenable to you? Yes, if it's necessary, it's amenable to me. OK, and then who seconded the uh, the amendment? I don't OK, and is that acceptable as an amendment to you? Yes, that's acceptable. All right. Is there a further discussion on the amendment as amended? Well, just could somebody read what we're voting on as far as what will the third paragraph say exactly? <laughs> Dr. Pugh, you are the uh, proposed amender. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was hoping that that uh, Marilyn, like she usually does, would magically <laughs> uh, come up with some words. Okay, so let's see. Um, and and I will. Uh, yield to Michelle to help me with this as well. Um, designates President Cassandra Albrecht and Vice President Pamela Pugh to discuss blah, 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 blah. Uh, let me see. Authorizes. Um, let's see. I think that this is where where uh, Michelle. This is yeah, this is yeah. What I was say this authorizes Pamela Pugh, with the assistance of Vice President, um, authorizes Cassandra Albrecht with the assistance of Vice President Pamela Pugh to blah blah blah. Okay. I'm good with that. So it's it's with the addition of the words to the amendment with the assistance. Of Vice President uh, Dr. Pamela Pugh. Yes, and it designates President Cassandra Albrecht and Vice President Pamela Pugh to discuss the case. And then in the second paragraph is where I think that there, we just want to make sure that that Cassandra um, is the lead uh, once we get to. That, that other stuff. So Mich Michelle, the way that you worded it, I'm I'm good with that. Okay. okay. I got it at the very beginning where we authorize Pamela Pugh, authorize Cassandra Olberg, and then with the assistance of Vice President Pamela Pugh. So you would be in there, but that would just make it at the very beginning that she's authorized and you will be assisting. So then you have an issue with this is this is what I this is my uh, um, proposed amendment um, taking into consideration your your friendly amendment designate President Cassandra Albrecht and Vice President Pam Pugh to discuss the Gary B. et al. v. Gretchen Whitmer et al. case with the Michigan Department of Education Attorney General authorizes President Cassandra Albrecht with assistance of Pamela Pugh to request on behalf of the board guidance and advice from the Attorney General's office relating to the Gary B case and designates President Albert to authorize filings by the Attorney General's office on behalf of the board consistent with supporting a fundamental right to basic minimum education. So to me that means that, that there is this opportunity for me to here um, firsthand uh, from the AG's office, and then it still leaves uh, President Albrecht uh, as the person authorizing any filings. I'm worried because we've had all these firewalls and different AGs, and it seems somewhat confused, you know, uh, who's advocating what. Um, that's my, I'm, I'm concerned with um, sort of a mixed um, 
mixed messages, but being interpreted by um, by by both. So I I I would like to know what you know, Cassandra and um, Judy, what you are your feelings on this. Uh, Dr. Dr. Pritchett, Dr. Albridge. Thank you. Um, I, I still am concerned. Uh, and again, I want to take personalities out of this. But uh, and Tom, I, I listened to your comments. But again, it has been my experience that when we get into issues of legality, when we get into issues of contracts with be it with superintendents or in local school districts, vendors, et cetera, that there has to be just one individual authorized by the board, certainly not an individual who goes off by themselves, but authorized by the board to make decision, and then who needs to come back to the board to say, this is where we're at, this is what I'm going to do on behalf of you, the board, because that's what you've asked me to do. The board always has the right to say, no, we we don't agree with that. So again, I'm just raising my concern about setting precedent, um, be it this issue, be it another issue down the road. Um, you know, certainly if, if Pam and Cassandra are comfortable with this, but um, Michelle is correct. I mean, there this is a complex case especially with the attorney general and the firewalls as they tried to exp excuse me explain them to them to us several months ago so uh, again I'm, I'm still going to be keep raising that we we voted in a president or uh, this individual to represent us as a board in these kinds of matters so that's kind of where i'm at right now uh, but um, i'd like to hear from cassandra at this point Thank you, Dr. Pritchett. Dr. Albrich, and Thank then uh, and then Dr. Pugh. Thank you. Um, so I just want to clarify one thing, and that is that anyone from the board has the ability to go talk to the AG's office. Um, there's this, this this resolution isn't about whether or not you can speak with the AG's office. This is about who has the authority on behalf of the board um, to be kind of the go between between the 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 boards, um, the majority of the board's desires versus the what we can do with the attorney general's office as a result of what the board has voted on. Um, not me as an individual board member, um, but the board as a whole. Uh, I feel like um, the language as proposed um, makes me question what my role is. And uh, and I am not, I'll be voting no, because I, I think at this point it's, I'm muddying what my role is. Um, and, and, you know, it's, I, being the president of this board is a considerable amount of work. Um, and it's something that I've taken very seriously and I've worked really hard to represent the board as a whole. And I, I just feel like uh, if the, if the other board members do not think that I do a good enough job with that. Um, there are remedies for that, uh, but I, I agree with with Judy. I think this is this is definitely setting a precedent. And you know, there are future board presidents who are uh, going to be impacted by this as well. Um, so that's all I will say. Uh, I will be voting no. Thank you. Me? I'm sorry, Dr. Pugh, I beg your pardon. Okay, first let me just, just establish that this is an unprecedented case. Um, I am not at all confused by the firewalls. I mean, Judy, you mentioned that there's some confusion. Um, Michelle, you, you mentioned that there, there has been confusion. There, I'm, I'm not at all confused, and that's why I think that I need to be able to be at the um, uh, one is someone who's able to listen and decipher what's being said by the AG's office. There was um, the time when my voice was misrepresented and I had to correct the AG's office. So I, I understand uh, 
the, the operations and the relationship between this board and the AG's office. And um, it's unfortunate. Let, let me first say that um, President Albrecht, I've never um, stepped aside of you uh, when we're dealing with different situations. I've always called you. I've not even picked up the phone to call people that I could call because I, I would call you first to make sure that you are represented as our president and that that you're um, so I, I, I most situ on most situations. This is a unprecedented situation. We've already seen where some of us stepped out uh, and and took a different uh, we, we did take a different position um, and we're told uh, that, that we could not uh, that changed. Um, now here we are and some some are catching up. Um, I want to make sure that it's known that we're talking about equity issues as it relates to black and brown children. I want to make sure that it is known that again, I'm not ashamed to say that everybody on this call, um, and there are others, um, but the ones that I'm talking to right now, um, I think that there's something that I can offer. Uh, and so I would like to be there to hear what the AG's office is saying. I would like to, to be there to make sure that I'm hearing it. Uh, and I have no problem with the, the, the president um, maintaining her authority uh, as would, would remain in the statement. Um, and so let me just make sure that I got everything out. Um, that, that I wanted to get out. And I think that there, there are other areas of that, that each of us have are areas of expertise. Um, and I think the fact that I've dealt with the AG's office uh, probably the most on this call as it relates to this case. Um, well, maybe there are a few who dealt with them more, but I do understand some of the intricacies of the, of the case. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Uh, Ms. Ramos-Montini and uh, uh, then a, um, a vote on a proposed resolution as read to us by Marilyn Schneider. I have a question after um, Ms. Ramos-Montini. Ramos okay, thank you. Hello, yes. can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I'm still in the same position where I strongly believe that uh, the team of Cassandra and Pam, with the two doctors, the president and vice president, are going to uh, articulate and, and come to uh, a, a recommendation for the board stronger because of the background that each of them bring to the situation. Pam is correct. She represents strongly uh, the black and brown children because we feel it, we have experienced it, because we're part of that community. And so uh, this is uh, an expertise, uh, an experience uh, that she will bring to the table. It is not the same uh, to hear it with uh, or in unison with Cassandra and hearing it at another at another time. It's going to be the same story, the same recommendation, the same whatever the, the uh, AG's office is going to offer, and both persons are going to be listening to the same message. And so I will be voting yes. Uh, because I strongly believe that this is, will be a stronger team to make uh, a, a strong recommendation to the to the board and I as a member of that board. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ramos Montini. Ms. Tilly, and then a vote. I would like to know um, how is communication going to happen because. I have not been getting um, briefed well on this at all by anybody, not by MDE, not by other state board members, not by the AG's office. 
Um, I haven't even heard from the AG's office since they said we we had to step away. As far as I mean, I, I've gotten emails recently, but um, I was wondering why all of a sudden I was getting emails from them because they said they had to be on another side of the wall from us because we stepped away. So I would like to know um, how better communication is going to happen. The AG is better briefing, better updates. The attorney general is responsible for that communication um, with state board members. It's my understanding that uh, the uh, lawyer in the attorney general's office has been communicating um, uh, with uh, with uh, members of the board. It's also my my understanding that given the sides on the issue that there has been dual communication from within the attorney general's office, there being a firewall within the attorney general's office on the issue. Um, I, I have not heard from the attorney uh, general's office um, via phone since last year sometime, since before the circuit court. Um, I was referring to, uh, I was referring we'll to, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'm sorry. I said I was referring to email communication uh, from the Attorney General regarding the recent filing for own bank review. Yeah, I, like I said, I just just got that email recently. I hadn't heard from them in months. So I, I'm not really getting updated. I'm not getting briefed. Um, I'm talking to, when I talk to a board member and ask, I might get a little information. Um, I'll call an activist to get information. I'm not really getting information. Okay. I think I maybe called you one time or something and, and asked and got some information. But, you know, a little information. I'm not really getting information. I'm, I'm, I'm reading articles and I'm, talking to activists, which I should be giving information to activists. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, the, um, any other um, reflections on the amendments? If not, Marilyn, if you would please read the amendment as amended um, by friendly amendment, if you will, by Ms. Fecto. Dr. Rice, I, I did want to just just give a comment uh, to to Board Member T Tilly. I don't know that any of us have really uh, talked to the to the AG's office, and and I'm hoping that now that we have this resolution, then that allows us to to speak uh, together uh, with with one voice. So I I don't know that outside of having conversations to with, with people who are in support of this case. Um, or the ruling uh, that just was came out that, that we have had any communication. Uh, but I think that this, this resolution helps us to speak with one voice. Well, that's what I'm trying to find out. Um, how is, is, is communication, I mean, is it saying that Cassandra is going to now be briefing us and informing us about what's going on? Because I'm not getting briefed, and I would like to be briefed on this. Um, so I'm trying to get clarity. Um, you did state that you had been talking to the AG's office, which I didn't know, but, um, you stated that a, a few minutes ago. So. Me, Pam? Uh, yeah, I thought you just said you had been talking with the AG's office. No, I said I, I have not. I, no, I have not. Oh, I thought you said you, you did. No. So. Does this mean that Cassandra is going to be briefing us or Cassandra and Pam will be? I just want to know how, because I would like to know, and it's frustrating to hear things in the news or, or have to call people um, outside of the board or MBE to find out information or even AG's office, because I didn't even know we were back in, in communication because they haven't called me and reached out to me. And I can, can I just answer? Because I want to just make sure I state my expectations. My expectations are that that Cassandra will be the spokesperson. And I just want to reiterate that I, I know I have not spoken with the AG's office when, when we've been copied on emails together. 
I think that that's, that has been when we've spoken to the AG's office. I think if I've, if I've had a question, I would ask Cassandra and then maybe we get the, a response all together from the, via email, uh, that email from, from the AG's office. I will say that when you and I uh, were separated, were separated off, that, that, that kind of, I think that that just uh, caused some of the, the communication uh, to be lost. But as I've had questions, I think maybe I said, uh, I called Cassandra and, and responses have come uh, in a few emails from the AG's office. But you said too that we are, that, that they were, they misinformed us, that we, um, to separate ourselves, but we're still supposed to be under the AG's office, I guess. Um, Talking about the two of us? Yes. The two of us, um, it, 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 it was confusing when they gave us a response, but I, I, re I filed as an individual. I, I was still sued just like the all eight of us. Um, and so I, the, 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 State board spoke on behalf of us as an individual. I did file an amicus brief, um, but other than that, that that is, and, and I did that with with my own attorney. So I don't, and so that has been since June. June is June, July is the last time that I spoke with the AG's office. Yeah, I read that on social media the other day that you filed a brief. So I really don't know what's going on. Um, so is it now that Cassandra is going to be the point person to give briefings on what's going on and what should be done? Because I, I would appreciate clarity on how we're going to move forward. We're going to we're going to vote on a uh, proposed amendment as amended that Marilyn Schneider is going to read to us, and then we're going to do a roll call vote. Marilyn, if you would, please. This is the final paragraph of the resolution. Three in parentheses designates Cassand President Cassandra Albrich and Vice President Pamela Pugh to discuss the Gary B. et al. versus Gretchen Whitmer et al. case with the Michigan Department of Attorney General authorizes President Cassandra Albrich with assistance of Vice President Pamela Pugh to request on behalf of the board, comma, guidance and advice from the Attorney General's office relating to the Gary B. case semicolon and designates President Cassandra Albrecht to authorize filings by the Attorney General's office on behalf of the board consistent with supporting a fundamental right to a basic minimum education. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Fecto, you had a comment and then a vote. Yeah, that, that wasn't my friendly amendment, but um, so um, I... What, what, what would you, what, what, uh, if, if that's not represented accurately, let's get it right. Yeah, mine, mine was, and you know, it was that it would just be the very beginning that President Albrecht, with the assistance of Pamela Pugh, in the very beginning, and that's it. Um, so that would make clear that they would be a team, but that the lead would go to, um, uh, Cassandra, I don't have any problem with making a statement saying that Pamela Pugh will be present in meetings with the AG's office at the end of that. Um, but I just wanted to be clear that when we talk about having discussions, that Pam is the president and the lead, and the vice president is to assist. That's, I think that would be in line with the spirit of what Judy was saying as far as protocol. I'm thinking it would be something that would address the concerns that Pam has brought up, but I, I just want it to be clear to whoever's reading this that the lead is, is Cassandra with the assistance of the vice president. And, and then again, if you want to put in that Pamela will be present in all meetings with the AG's office, that's fine with me. I just don't want it to be that the two of them are both authorized to have discussions 
in, do them separately and have, you know, uh, I don't I don't think that's clear. So that's that's I, I like the idea of a team. I like this idea of unity, but I think it's important that to recognize the president as the president and taking the lead. I, and I do too, Michelle. Um, Dr. Rice, I to jump in because I don't want to be a wonderful moment um, into the ground. And, and Michelle, if you could just read it, just read it one more time as you stated. Okay, and I don't have the language in front of me. My computer will turn off if I do. But um, at the very beginning where it says, um, authorizes uh, Cassandra, President Cassandra Olberg to have discussion with, okay. and then, and with this, and with the, you know, has with, with the assistance of Pamela Pugh. Okay. Then at the end, you could add. Um, and and uh, I'm good with that. I, when, you, when you first said it, because you, you're, not, I assume you were looking at it. When you no, no. authorize, no. that comes down at the bottom, and so designate starts the. Oh, designate. So, so um, uh, I am good with that. We didn't even have to go this long. I think that's that's okay. worth. Uh, Marilyn, can do you did you get that? Okay. I, is it only the edit in the first line, or are we adding something at the end? Well, I'm. Yeah. If that would resolve it, I think that would be. Um, that would be good if that makes. Um, OK, let me I, I'm happy to read this as I have it now. Designates pres. This is a three in parentheses. Designates President Cassandra Albrich with assistance of Vice President Pamela Pugh to discuss the Gary B. at all versus Gretchen Whitmer at all case with the Michigan Department of Attorney General. Semicolon authorizes President Cassandra Albrich to request, comma, on behalf of the board, comma, guidance and advice from the Attorney General's office related to the Gary B. case, semicolon, and designates President Cassandra Albrich to authorize filings by the Attorney General's office on behalf of the board consistent with supporting a fundamental right to a basic minimum education. That is fine. And, and, I, and I would like to be a part of the conversations, but guess what? I'm going to trust that our president will include me in that. So I'm good with that. OK, OK, so we have a we have a uh, amendment as amended on the table. A roll call vote, please, Marilyn. Wait, are, we, are we voting on the it, was that a friendly amendment then? So we're not voting on the amendment. We're just voting on the resolution. It's we good. are voting on the amendment as amended in a friendly fashion. Um, it is a, a vote on the amendment it is not a vote on the base resolution. Marilyn, roll call vote, please. Fecto. Yes. McMillan. Uh, yes. Pritchett. No. Hugh. Yes. Ramos Montini. Yes. Snyder. No, no. Tilly. Yes. Albrecht. No. Five yes, three no. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Now we're voting on the resolution as a whole. Uh, Marilyn, if you would be kind enough to do a roll call vote on the resolution as a whole. Facto. Yes. McMillan. No. Pritchett. Yes. Hugh. Yes. Ramos Montini. Yes. Snyder. Yes. Snyder. No. 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 Tilly. Yes. Albrich. Yes. Six yeses, two noes, motion carries. Thank you very much. We're now at the point in the agenda where we have comments by state board members. I'm told by uh, State Board Executive Marilyn Schneider that we have seven minutes before we go off of Teams Live, and we can always come back for a third session if necessary. Any board members who wish to offer comments? Um, I just have a quick question. Yes. Um, I've been told that the Michigan Alliance for Families um, conducted a survey of special ed uh, services, and I was wondering if I could get a copy of that. Okay, we will uh, we will request that and uh, and share that with all board members. 
Um, thank you very much, Ms. Fecto. Any other comments by state board members? Dr. Uh, Dr. Pugh. Oh, I'll just jump in. I, I just wanted to make sure um, we've had some really lively debates today. Um, and uh, Nikki, I want to make sure that you know that I have the utmost respect for, for Tom. And so I did not, uh, you know, I will apologize uh, because I do appreciate the spirit in which we all work together as eight board members. Um, I just wanted to make sure that as government workers that, you know, folks do know that there's a passion that many of us have and that, that we're driven by. And so, um, again, I just thank, thank the teamwork that, that we uh, pull together for the children, for, for our children across this, this state. Um, um, and very defensive of the work that, that our educators, including the Department of Education, do for our children. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Tilly, then Ms. Ramos Montigny in our remaining six minutes. Um, a couple of things. First, I, I've lost many, including my sister in law. Um, we have lost two great lawmakers now due to coronavirus, two friends uh, of mine, state rep. Isaac Robinson, and now most recently, uh, former state Senator Morris Hood III. And I just wanted to take the time to acknowledge them for their work and their leadership. Also, um, ad addressing the right to literacy case, the state of Michigan has a functional illiteracy rate of 18%, but Detroit has a functional illiteracy rate of 47%. I was born and raised in Detroit. I graduated from Henry Ford High School. There are many times when Detroit is left to figure things out on its own, which has consistently sent a message that the rest of the state doesn't care about Detroit because the city and the schools are largely populated by African Americans as well as other minorities. Well, these kids figured things out on their own. They took drastic measures and had the circuit court standing behind them. And I stand behind them. Even their current superintendent, Dr. Beatty, was with us in that circuit courtroom standing with them. The circuit court has declared that they have a constitutional right to literacy. When America took on the job to offer a free education to every child within its shores, it took on the responsibility to make sure those children are literate, they are educated, and that they have an equitable education in every zip code. This case has set a precedent to ensure that. It makes Detroit, Michigan a leader in education. This is historical, not just for Detroit, not just for Michigan, but for every child in every zip code. This can help to catapult equitable education here in Michigan and how we educate our children in the United States for generations. It is our duty as educators, as stakeholders, as leaders, as state board members to uphold their constitutional rights. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tilly. Uh, Ms. Ramos Montigny, I'm going to give you the benediction, but I do want to note before I do that we have future meetings, a work session on May 20th, uh, regular board meetings on June 9th and August 11th. Ms. Ramos Montigny, you have the benediction at 351 with three minutes left in the board meeting. Oh, I just want to say thank you uh, to you, uh, Superintendent, and also uh, all the board members. We had a very good meeting, very spirited, very, it was good, it was good. And I thank all the people that presented to us today. We're still in this uh, pandemic, going through this pandemic, and things are not going to be the same. Well, I don't know how long. But we're making the best of it, and I truly appreciate everything that everybody does all over, all over. Educators are coming forth, and it's all good. So thank you very much, and have a safe rest of the time until we see each other. Thank you, Ms. thank you, Ms. Ramos Montini. Thank you, State Board. Um, any topics for future board members, please share those uh, via email with Marilyn or me. And we do stand adjourned at 3.52 p.m. Thank you. Thank you.